Midland. Okay, good evening. I'd like to welcome you all to the 2022 Southern Georgia Bay Chamber of Commerce, Midland Mayor and Deputy Mayor All Candidates Forum. Thank you to the candidates uh, who have joined us this evening. Uh, I would begin, I'd like to begin by introducing the, these candidates, starting alphabetical order uh, with Mayor and then Deputy Mayor. First, we have William Gordon, Jonathan Main, Uta Schmidt-Jones, and Stuart Strathern. And for Deputy Mayor, Jack Conton and Cody Ocheski. My name is Peter Costu, and I will be this evening's moderator. My goal tonight is to allow the candidates an opportunity to present and inform you uh, of their platforms. I will now go over the agenda for this evening's meeting, which will consist of introductions, questions, open discussion after each question, and then closing statements. The introduction by the candidates will be a maximum of one minute. Next will be the questions, which have been pre-submitted and then previewed by the candidates. Answers will have one and a half minute time limit. In terms of vetting the questions, they were selected from a variety of submitted questions of various topics. Many good questions, many valid concerns were submitted, but unfortunately due to time constraints, we cannot ask them all. Uh, we'll then have an open uh, discussion after each question answered by all the candidates, uh, by answered by the candidates. This will be have a maximum time limit of five minutes. Because of the uh, limits of Zoom meetings, it will be difficult not to talk upon each other, but you know, we'll try. Uh, but I do ask that we all respect each other's chance to speak. I should note that if the conversation does get a little unruly or dominating, uh, Kathy will be using the mute button. Finally, there will be a concluding speech from each candidate and that will be have a one limit time limit. A ring tone will sound 15 seconds before the time is up and a bell will ring then again uh, when the time has expired. I should note that you are welcome to use your time as you wish by answering questions or responding to other candidates. Uh, well, I try to make this short as possible. I'd like to, uh, without any further delay, I'd like to get things started. I'll hand over the mic to our tonight's first candidate for the opening remarks, and that will be Bill Gordon. Thank you very much. Honey, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow candidates. My name is Bill Gordon, and I have the honor of serving as one of your counselors in 2018, since 2018. Prior to that, I served as community as a peace officer with the former Midland Police Service and as a small business owner and employer. My family draw the roots back to the founding families of this community, and I champion a collaborative municipal government where residents participate in our decision-making and feel empowered, heard, and respected. I'm a strong proponent of mediation and compromise, except in matters of integrity and honesty, and I'll stand up for the community, even against considerable opposition, and remain open and accessible to community feedback as well as critique. I believe in putting our community first in all decision-making and to ensure your voice is heard at the council table. I plan to build a team that works together in harmony and talks through the inevitable division and conflict. We do have an opportunity to change the tone at Town Hall this term, and I'm asking for your support to help me do that and look forward to working both with you and for you as your mayor in the next four years. Thank you, Melcy McWitch. Thank you, Bill. Next, uh, we'll go to uh, Jonathan Main for opening comment. Hello, so my name is Jonathan Main. I grew up in Midland, Ontario. I went to Monsignor Cassex in St. Teresa's High School. I went to McMaster Engineer uh, and took civil engineering at McMaster University. And uh, since coming back to Midland with my uh, beautiful wife, we just celebrated 10 year uh, anniversary. We have two kids that go to Mondays Bay. Uh, since 2014, I've been on uh, town council for the last two terms, and I've served on a variety of committees and boards. And I'm wholeheartedly dedicated to continue to provide quality municipal services for you in Midland. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jonathan. Next, uh, we'll go to Uta Schmidt-Jones for her opening statement. Thank you to the Chamber. Have you ever caught a summer sunrise on Little Lake as the rowing club cuts the water with their oars? Maybe you volunteered for Ontario's best butter tart festival, meeting vendors and visitors from all over Ontario. What about photographing wildflowers at Pete Peterson Park or have you challenged your cardio fitness by walking all the way up the entire length of Victoria Street? Have you tasted Gianetto's dip lined up for Dino's Deli or sipped Dragon Tear tea at Grounded Coffee? I'm Uta Schmidt-Jones and I spend lots of time championing Midland's amenities on social media and I'd like to do this even more as your new mayor. Thank you. Thanks, Uta. Thanks, Uta. 
Next, we'll go to uh, Jack Cotton for introduction. Good evening. I'm Jack Conton, and I'm running to be your next deputy mayor. I am an experienced counselor and leader. I chaired various committees when I was on council, such as administration, planning, human resources, and indigenous relations, and was the alternate for deputy mayor and mayor at Simcoe County. This has prepared me to be your deputy mayor. My commitment to you is that I'll fight for integrity. I will listen to everyone. I will ensure your voice is heard and I will get things done. Together, we will make Midland a thriving community. Miigwech and thank you. Thank you, Jack. Next we'll go to Cody Ochesky for introductions. Thank you very much. Hi Midland, my name is Cody Ochesky. I'm very grateful and proud to have been on your town council for the last eight years. I think I bring a great energy to council when I attend meetings and events. I work well as a team player as well as a leader. I speak endlessly about this town everywhere I travel. Both of my parents are proud Midlanders. My wife and my one-year-old daughter are both very proud born and raised Midlanders as well. I believe in honesty, trust, and open, transparent government. Midland is a beautiful and diverse community and I'm committed to working hard for every resident. I feel being deputy mayor and getting added county council role gives me the ability to be at the table discussing some of the larger issues that are becoming bigger issues in our little town. I want to be at the table discussing affordable housing solutions, homelessness, our opioid, fentanyl, and other addiction issues, mental health issues, and food scarcity. And I want to remove the stigma from discussing all of these issues and bring some solutions home from upper levels of government. If re-elected, I will commit my four years of hard work and dedication with a smile on my face. Most times. Midland is my passion. Thank you. Thanks, Cody. Uh, and I just realized, uh, my apologies, uh, Stuart, I, I <laughs> skipped over you, nothing personal. Uh, just my terrible eyesight. Uh, so now we're going to go to a Sir Chapter uh, running for mayor for introductions. Thank you, Peter, and thank you for hosting this. Uh, it's uh, as I goes well saying it as your mayor. I'm proud of what this council has done, the decisions they've made in moving the uh, agenda of Midland forward. Uh, as one person I know very well said, making Midland's future arrive ahead of schedule. We need to keep up that momentum. Uh, keep taking action to promote growth and opportunity in our town. I want Midland to be a prosperous community, uh, providing value for taxes, good jobs, and a sound economy, a vibrant, livable community where our children and grandchildren grow up and have a choice to call Midland home. I'm fifth generation Midland. I went away, took a degree in wildlife biology, served uh, 10 years to Predator Research Group. Uh, started a company that now has a presence in uh, seven countries around the world and uh, is a leader in its uh, marketplace. I bring the skills from that, that, that uh, company to the table here in Midland. I believe that these past four years I've demonstrated leadership, the skill and commitment in guiding your council in serving Midland. We have made fiscally responsible decisions that created opportunities for economic success necessary for growing our community while never forgetting our Midland roots. I commit to providing you the same strong, capable leadership for the next term of council. Uh, please uh, consider your, marking your ballots through Strathern, and we'll continue on a path of growth and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, we'll now move on to the questions. These are questions that have, a pre, have been pre-submitted by email and phone. Please note that the purpose of this forum uh, is to enlighten us on the position of the candidates. I would, uh, however, again, remind the candidates that they are free to use their time during the question uh, as they wish and respond to the question, respond to other candidates, uh, however you feel. The questions will be asked tonight will be ones that can be posed to all candidates. And the first question. In the past, we have seen how ineffective a council is when they are divided. What would your strategy be to keep council from infighting and forming camps? Uh, we'll start with uh, Jonathan Mean. Uh, thank you so much. Um, you know, this is an interesting question. Uh, since I've served on council, uh, we've worked with a variety of people across various uh, political ideologies, you know, thinking back to the 2014 term, uh, Pat File, a dear NDP supporter, George McDonald, a strong red, and, and Mike Ross, a true blue conservative. But we all work together and collaboratively. And I think that's really what's most important is that we maintain our independence at the municipal level. And that allows us to advocate for and against uh, various policies put forward by the federal and the provincial governments. 
we have a, a duty to serve our community responsibly, but also to have a diversity of opinions. And so I think that a, a diverse council reflects a diverse view set of, of, of the community. And I think that's really important. And what lesson that I've learned since serving on council is, you know, you, you discuss the major issues, you, you debate and you argue. Sometimes you debate minor issues as well, but as soon as there's the vote, one way you move on to the next issue and the majority of times we agree on most things and so i think that that's really a really key point is to continue to be uh respectful and respectfully disagree and uh sometimes we disagree with staff sometimes we disagree with people in our community and sometimes we disagree amongst each other but i think that that's a really key point is to just continue to maintain uh respect and professionalism while allowing the opportunity for people to bring forth uh different views and opinions diversity is critical for uh, municipal government. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, next, we'll go to Uta. In the past, we have seen how ineffective council is when they are divided. What would your strategy be to keep council from infighting and forming camps? So I asked, do we really want a council that only sees from one lens of perceived lived experience? The strength of an elected body of representatives is in its ability to advocate for a diversity of residents and, and lifestyles as it mitigates for change and development. Council members must be able to step outside of their own silos and be open to inclusionary thinking. Electing candidates who have successfully navigated through personal change might be a good place to start. Electing candidates who respect and resource professional accreditation on community issues will also ensure a better outcome for a more socially inclusive Midland. Thanks, Uta. And next we'll go to uh, Stuart Strathlin. In the past, we have seen how ineffective a council is when they are divided. What would your strategy be to keep council from infighting and forming camps? Thank you. Uh, first of all, kudos to this council for uh, coming together and making tough decisions to uh, move the Midlands agenda forward. I would agree with uh, Councillor Main, John Main, in that uh, council is, uh, has been uh, remarkably collegial and voting suggested independent thought, which I think is essential in a council, uh, based on facts discussed in council uh, rather than emotion, uh, vetted through experts such as staff and those people who council consider to have uh, knowledge of uh, subject matter experts. Uh, they voted on it and then they come together to support council's will and not backslide. Uh, that's uh, nonetheless, at the outset, I see the role of mayor as being a, a facilitator to achieve consensus among council members, facilitate, usually in a facilitated process and involving staff where you set a direction, you agree a general direction, you set out a policy document that guides staff and how they will support uh, council in terms of making their decisions and then move forward. I think that uh, as, as Councillor Main did uh, um, say, and I think uh, Uta Schmidt said the same, Council needs to be comprised of independent thinking people who act on facts, not on emotion, who look at the best interests of the broadest segment of the municipality, dig into the facts and issue, and then uh, 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 vote on, on those matters and move on. Um, I think it's important to uh, understand that each councillor has one vote, uh, that they should be independent thinkers. They work, as I said, from fact, and they work on the best outcomes for the residents of the town's future. Uh, we need to ensure, and in fact, I've helped try to ensure that councillors, especially new councillors, have access to resources to allow them to come to speed, which is essential uh, because it's a fast moving uh, process. So uh, we've increased councillors allows, for example, to be trained. Uh, you need strong Thank leadership and experience to Thank coach council and ensure they're informed. Thank you, sir. Staff. That's it. Sorry, yeah. Did you hear the first? I don't know if you heard the first bu buzzer. No? Wasn't loud enough? I don't okay. think I did, but, but thank you for Sorry. that. We'll, we'll, give, you, we'll give you 15 seconds there if you like to finish no, no, it's off. Fine. No, it's good. good. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll turn up the volume on, the volume on that. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, Jack Conton. Oh, you're mute, Jack.
you want to see, we can come back to you, Jack, after we'll. Yeah, we're still on mute. We'll come back. Oh, there you go, Jack. Try that. Okay, ready? Yep. Or, yeah, okay, thank you. <clears throat> As I was about to say, you can't control other people. You can only control yourself. We do have the Municipal Act to help guide members of council about what's acceptable, and everyone receives the same training on the act and the expectations of council. I like to lead by example, treating everyone with respect and ensuring there is an atmosphere of good dialogue. I noticed that this past term, some of council seemed to sway away from promises of listening to each other or to the residents, and this causes conflict. Good communication and transparency with the public, even among council members, can elevate some of the frustrations and conflicts that arise when there are opposing views. We'll always have opposing views, and that is good, but the trick is to try and bring everyone to consensus by maximizing possible gains for everyone. As chair of, of the Committee of the Whole, I promise to lead with respect and demonstrate integrity. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Next, we'll go to uh, Cody Ochesky. In past, we have seen how ineffective a council is when they are divided. What would your strategy be to keep council from infighting and forming camps? Thank you very much. This is a, a big part of my platform, Team Midland, and I've drove everybody nuts with that term for the last eight years. I believe working together as a team is so critical to the performance level of council, maintaining level of confidence of staff and town of Midland employees. Having teams on council can create a whole atmosphere of uncertainty and can create divide within the organization as well. We need to lead by example and get over our personal differences, if any, and work together as a team to help share that philosophy across town. We need to be doing more team building exercise, attending more public events together, getting our faces out into the public. We will not agree on every topic, topic, but it's important that we're voting for what we believe best serves our public rather than against councillors that you don't always align with. In the first meetings of council, we establish our strategic goals. I think this is a critical time for our team to get to know each other and get a feel for what motivated each person to want to take on this role. I will commit to working with whoever is elected respectfully, fairly, and I will communicate openly with any member of council at any time. If you asked any of the current eight sitting people on council, I'm confident that they would give me a positive reference in this regard. I commit to helping new councillors get comfortable, and I commit to never stopping learning from councillors with more experience than me. I feel we need to reestablish strong connections with our boards, local charities, service groups, and work as a council to bring these groups to the table. I feel as a council, we sometimes wait for these groups to come to us, and I think we need to do a better job with the we'll come to you approach. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. And next, we'll go to uh, Bill Gordon. In the past, we have seen how ineffective a council is when they are divided. What would your strategy be to keep council from infighting and forming camps? That's a very good question. Um, and it's one that I've struggled with for the past four years. I can tell you in my professional experience, a true leader knows how to build consensus among their teams. It's imperative to welcome and respect the diverse experience, perspectives and opinions from each member of council who are each elected to be the voice of the residents. Effective leadership actively listens to all perspectives and guides their team towards an outcome that aligns with our strategic goals and objectives, while respecting that each member may see another path to those goals. When teammates feel respected, heard, and valued, the camp mentality is diminished. In my experience, the key to conflict resolution is communication and compromise, except, of course, in matters of integrity and honesty. You'll hear that repeated theme this evening. I have a and continue to lead diverse and multicultural teams in my professional career. And I'm no stranger to working collaboratively towards common goals, ensuring that all counselors have access to all the same information so we can make good decisions. As we struggle with crippling inflation, rising interest rates, the post pandemic recovery, and a tax rate that requires a firm hand to team, I'm asking for your support to lead our town through these challenges collaboratively as we work towards financial stability and the ultimate goal of prosperity. As a wise Vulcan once said, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Thank you, Bill. Uh, now we'll have the open discussion. I um, don't know what uh, what you'd like to add to that or, or, or what, but uh, I'll put you on the spot, Jonathan. Did you want to start uh, start that open discussion? Anything you want to add to anything you've heard? Um, sure. Uh, this is a fun part where we get to just kind of go off script here. Uh, but 
you know, I think that is important what everyone said, you know, um, we have a great opportunity. It, the one thing that's exciting for me running for mayor is looking at all the great council candidates. And I think the Midland has a fantastic opportunity to elect a diverse cast of uh, candidates uh, from young to old, from experience to, uh, to new, uh, new ideas. So I think that's really exciting for Midland uh, that this opportunity to have a diverse uh, cast of candidates. I just wanted to make that note that I'm yeah, really looking forward to working with uh, all the many uh, councillors that are elected. Thank you. Thanks, John. Anyone else want to add anything to that's been said or? Everyone's good? Okay. Move on to question number two. You all mentioned beautiful Georgian Bay as a as major asset for Midland in your election materials. And yet the town's sewage system continues to dump waste directly into the bay. It is desperately in need of upgrading. Is this project a priority for you? How will the team pay for how will the town pay for it without raising taxes? Will development dollars from the Midland Bay Landing project fund the sewage treatment project? And I will start this with uh, Uta. Thank you. So yes, it is, of course, a priority. I am concerned, though, that there is a desire to move Midland's shopping district away from the downtown core to Midland Bay Landing. And that's something that won't respect our natural Georgian Bay shoreline. We're under pressure from the provincial master plan to increase our residential capacity here in Simcoe County municipalities and uh, expanding our ability to fund infrastructure improvements like wastewater management will come of course from provincial government support. And yes, nobody wants to say it, but you do have to increase taxes. Um, one of the ways that uh, residents who struggle with tax, in tax increases may consider uh, Im improving their situation might be considering they might want to lease a tiny house in on their property in the backyard um, maybe rent a room out in their home or even consider turning their garages into apartments with municipal loans currently being offered by Simcoe County for these very applications um, as we age sharing our homes in creative ways may actually assist us in living independently longer. Thanks, Uta. And next, uh, we'll go to uh, Stuart Strathern. And I won't read the whole question. I'll just read the uh, second half. Is this a project a priority for you? How will the town pay for it without raising taxes? Will the development dollar from the Midland Bay Landing Project fund the sewage treatment project? Thank you. First of all, I have to disagree with the, uh, the initial assumptions uh, uh, for the question. Midland has been uh, consistently upgrading the capacity of its sewage treatment facility to characterize it as we're dumping. It almost feels like we're dumping continuously waste into the into the Georgian Bay, and that's not the case at all. Last year, there was one uh, overflow as a result of a 100-year storm, basically. Secondly, uh, this year, there's been no uh, overflow. Those overflows are reported very transparently to the public and to MOE. And in fact, we are regulated very strongly by them. We, uh, they provide us with a license to, for a certain amount. If we exceed that, then they're all over the group. Our group at, uh, uh, at the uh, sewage uh, treatment plant and the, uh, the water facilities are actually highly respected across the province, particularly within MOE and also with the Simple Muskoka District Health Unit. I think it's important to understand that the municipality is continuously upgrading the system, not only at the plant, but also with respect to twinning uh, water and wastewater. Uh, when we did downtown uh, Midland, King Street uh, rejuvenation and rebuilding, at one point we were pumping over a million liters of water that would normally have gone into the sewage treatment plant. Out to, and, and this was just weeping into the system. So we've actually expanded capacity at the plant. We expect it to be at least uh, viable through to the uh, late 2030s. If we partner with Pentatang Machine and piggyback on their facilities, uh, we could be looking at considerable extension and shared costs. Uh, so I would just say in, in closing that we have a very successful uh, uh, operation funding through Midland Bay Landing as possible, also, also funding uh, through the MPUC uh, community-wide fund. And uh, either one of those would have to follow a uh, financial uh, analysis. Thank you, Stuart. Next we go to, to Jack Conton. Again, I'll just read the second uh, half of the question. Is this project a priority for you? How will the town pay for it without raising taxes? Will the development dollars from the Midland Bay Landing Project uh, fund uh, the sewage treatment project? Yes, 
we have historically been responsive to the health of Georgian Bay. In 1987, Severn Sound was declared an area of concern due to the pollution from wastewater, agriculture, and shoreline development. But in 2003, it was delisted thanks to the efforts of many different organizations. And although current spills of sewage into Georgian Bay are monitored and deemed as acceptable during major rain events, it raises concerns for the use of the bay. Climate change will only magnify this problem. We need to do everything possible, including taking aggressive actions to separate our sanitary and storm sewers in parts of town that haven't yet been replaced. We also need to upgrade our aging water and wastewater treatment plant and upgrade our asset management plan so that we have a better understanding of our underground assets and costs to replace them. This will allow us to make difficult but responsible decisions for now and into the future. Some of the cost of wastewater upgrades will come from partnerships with upper levels of government, although the grants will be looked at for, from reserve funds, from financing, and new developments should be billed for their portion through development charges. It's important that we are ready to apply for grants when they become available. Great. Thank you, Jack. Uh, next, we go to uh, Cody Ochevsky. Again, I'll just read the second half. Is this project a priority for you? How will the town pay for it without raising taxes? Will the development dollars for the Mid Midland Bay Landing project fund the sewage treatment plant project? Thank you very much. I want to agree with uh, a lot of what uh, Mayor Strathairn has said and a few things that Jack Clinton said as well. Uh, the Main Street rejuvenation during this term separated the sewage lines from the Main Street from the stormwater drainage system. This means that the rainwater isn't being unnecessarily treated and sewage isn't being discharged in our bay as it goes directly to the sewage treatment plant. As you just heard, we had one event last year and no events yet this year. We need to continue to upgrade these lines across town. This is definitely a priority for me. There is no amount of sewage discharge into the bay that's justifiable and I won't sit here for a minute and a half trying to defend it. To answer the second part of the question, perhaps Midland Bay Landing does help this. Uh, proceeding with phase one of Midland Bay Landing would relieve our reserves by over four and a half million dollars. This one would undoubtedly help uh, our already strained reserves. Thank you. Thanks, Cody. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, Bill Gordon. Again, on the second half. Is this project a priority for you? How will the town pay for it without raising taxes? Will the development dollars from the Midland Bay Landing project fund the sewage treatment project? All right, well, first off, Georgian Bay is definitely one of our most precious shared assets. And it's the reason why so many are drawn to make Midland their home and protecting our source water and natural environment are top priorities for me. But our aging infrastructure will require millions of dollars to maintain, upgrade, replace, and repair. And the work we've already undertaken that's been alluded to tonight to twin our storm sewers and sanitary sewers has already had a significant reduction in the number of outflow events into our bay. And I'd like to highlight again that's zero this year. As climate change continues to impact us with events of greater magnitude and frequency, we must continue to adapt to offset the impacts of our aging infrastructure. Water and wastewater are primarily ratepayer supported and not drawn from our general pool of property taxes. So we need to press for grants and funding sources from all upper tiers of government as residents alone lack the ability to pay for these upgrades despite the planned growth projections. As for phase one Midland Bay landing, it'll repay the cost of acquiring the land in 2012. Primarily rate-based fees from any new residential or future commercial will contribute towards the wastewater costs. And then, of course, phase two sales, perhaps a decade or more into the future, shouldn't even be factored into our near-term needs. My preference is to press for grants and funding, as did our neighbouring Penetang machine, whose Main Street reconstruction was almost entirely funded by grants, while Midland's left with a $14 million bill. Attempting to tie in the future of Midland Bay landing to our critical rate-based infrastructure needs is conflating two issues, two very distinct issues that we face and shouldn't be used to scare the community into hastily selling off our waterfront for residential development. Thank you, Bill. And finally, we'll go to Jonathan Main. Thank you. Yeah, good thing, my, good thing my uh, public speaking is better than my taping ability. Uh, so as a lot of people have uh, mentioned, the town of Midland has, has been implementing a combined sewer uh, separation program for the last about 20 or so years. We still have about, you know, 15 or so years to, uh, to go if we do one street a year. King Street was very significant in terms of reducing uh, uh, rainwater getting into our sanitary sewer systems as, as 
uh, Mayor mentioned about a million liters are diverted, but also we had green technology to allow for infiltration. So uh, plastic products made right here in Midland uh, underneath the sidewalk have allowed for uh, infiltration for rain, but also to allow for the tree roots to grow. So we're gonna have big, beautiful trees. Uh, also worth noting is staff have made huge success by calibrating Chamber A, which is the second outflow for our system at Midland Avenue and Bayshore. And just from staff recalibrating that, it's working effectively and we're seeing fewer and fewer overflows at the uh, secondary location. Uh, as mentioned, climate change is going to increase storm severity and intensity. So low impact development uh, and green technology, as you mentioned, is, is critical to review. In terms of the sewage treatment plant, we're very fortunate that we've done a great uh, master plan on how we upgrade our sanitary sewer system. We're very fortunate that we don't have to take on one big mega project. We can break up the upgrades and uh, replacement projects into smaller chunks. Uh, there's still many millions of dollars that would require for expansion and uh, repair. Uh, and so that's gonna require infrastructure funding from the province or the federal government. We do have a little bit of debt capacity that we can look to, but obviously uh, that's a key thing for federal funding. And finally, uh, microplastics is a, a real issue. And so other communities are looking at decentralized approach because the majority of microplastics are actually coming through our laundry system. So looking at uh, decentralized systems that try to remove microplastics from the system is uh, important as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Just before the bell rang, good, uh, good timing. Um, we'll now open the discussion uh, again. Um, seems to be a lot of you in agreement, um, but Uta, is there anything you'd like to add to uh, what's been said today? It seems to me that this Midland Bay Landing Project is supposed to fund all kinds of projects in our community. That's the, the direction we keep hearing. Oh, well, the Midland Bay Landing is going to pay for this. Midland Bay Landing is going to pay for that. And uh, I think the projects that Midland Bay Landing is going to pay for seem to be increasing, increasing, increasing and to a point where, of course, a project like that can't fund all of those projects. So we have to talk about where's the money going to come from realistically. We have to talk about um, making more space for more residents in our community and sharing a tax load with maybe a, a renter in your property that it could cover those extra taxes for you in the year, maybe pay for your snow plowing in the year, maybe even help you share your grocery expenses every month. All kinds of ways of extending your ability to live in your house longer independently. Thanks, Uta. And anyone else want to add anything before moving on this question? Yes, okay, well, I saw Stuart Tango up first there. Thank you, I just want to point out that in fact, the levy does not pay for water wastewater. The provincial government mandated that water wastewater users must pay for the system. One of the big things that's happening and it's sort of a counterintuitive is, uh, is conservation. So just reduce the use of water. That would be one big start. But what happens then is, is you start to place, you start to place uh, pressure on costs to operate the system. As far as government grants go, we are uh, pursuing government grants uh, we get gas tax money all the time, which is uh, when you think about replacing infrastructure and road network, linear assets, you're talking about roads, you're ripping up a road. So you try to plan that so that with the road maintenance is required, you're replacing your in-ground in -ground infrastructure. Gas tax monies can be applied to those sorts of things. Uh, I don't believe that, uh, that uh, we are likely to be, what's going to fund all of this is, is to continue to have growth. If you, if you, if you have growth, the right kind of growth that respects what Midland is, that's going to fund these sorts of things, along with the upper levels of government. Okay, and uh, was someone else want to add to that? I saw uh, Jack, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm really interested in the town and the reserve system that we have for the town. The reserves is very important. If we're up good, then we're in good shape. But if we're not, it makes it very difficult. And we also need to look at our partnerships with the federal and provincial governments to make sure that if we apply for infrastructure funding, we need to have that capacity. When I looked at the big dig, it, it, it sort of brought some concerns just in terms of uh, applying for funding and the funding wasn't there. And it, I'm trying to figure out what, what the issue was. I think that 
our partners need to be a part of our planning for the town. So that's my concern with the reserve system and making sure we apply for the partnership for funding federal and provincial. Okay, thanks, Jack. Uh, I saw Bill and then we'll go to Cody, if that's all right. Thanks, I wanna echo uh, actually Stuart's comments about growth, growth in our community. I mean, it's important that we preserve our small town charm, but we need to grow or we're gonna die. And one of the things that's been concerning me, you know, this term is the thousands, literally thousands of homes and rentals and apartment buildings that were planned for rentals, just sitting and planning and issues with planning, whether they're fighting the town through a, an OLT appeal or other, other uh, issues we've seen, you know, play out in the media. There are thousands of homes that could be de injecting development charge money, millions of dollars in development charges and property taxes to help offset the cost of operating this municipality responsibly. And development is absolutely critical to critical and growth and responsible development is critical. But I'll tell you, we need to unclog the pipes in planning. And I'm not laying this on the feet of our specific planners, but planning in general with a capital P and get these homes built and the development charges in and get those property taxes rolling into the town to help offset the burden of the rest of our residents. Thank you, Bill. Okay, Cody. Thank you very much. I want to respond to uh, Mr. Cotton's comments about uh, reserves, about water wastewater upgrades and uh, asset management. So last week, last Wednesday at council, we got the asset management plan and the strategic plan to uh, replace piping over the next decades uh, of our future. So I'm curious, um, I have to give credit to Catherine McDonald. She sat in the audience for the last two council meetings. And I think that's critical to wanting to run for council is being familiar with the uh, agendas. So last Wednesday, we saw the strategic plan and we saw that we are underfunding uh, the replacement of these pipes by approximately $900 per household per year. So I'm just curious if Mr. Conton has reviewed this document. How do you feel about the document? What upgrades do you feel we need at the wastewater treatment system? And how do you fund them when your card says that you plan on replenishing reserves? Well, thank you, Cody. That's a really good question. It's all about the historical aspect of understanding the financial situation at the town. Uh, over the last number of years, everything has been depleted. Uh, and making recommendations through plans is, is an excellent approach to solving the problem. But uh, my understanding is that the reserves have been depleted. And how do you correct that issue when we have to deal with growth for the, for the community? Uh, there's got to find a, a balance here. And I think that's what I'm asking is, are the reserves at a stable uh, situation or is it low? Or do we need to find a way to, for the long-term planning, to build these reserves so we're not in trouble like we have had in the past, uh, like the big dig? Um, I'm just, just kind of curious with that. And I'm not privy to a, a lot of the information, but that's one of the concerns that I have uh, about moving forward. Okay, Jonathan, uh, and then Stuart, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up to the next question. Uh, thank you. I uh, just want to mention a lot of the uh, comments about the asset management plan that was just approved last week. The number of our current infrastructure deficit is an astronomical $400 million, over $400 million. That's at 2022 dollars. So that's going to be a huge challenge for us to replace our existing infrastructure. Second point I really want to make is Town of Midland uh, takes all of its uh, drinking water from groundwater. And so that's why source water protection has been a really huge emphasis to try to continue to promote infiltration so we protect our uh, precious aquifers and we're not pulling out too much water that can be regenerated and recharged. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay, Stuart, you want to wrap up this question? Yeah, sure. I just want to respond to the 3,500 homes that are in the planning queue. Uh, the suggestion that it's being clogged up in planning. In fact, it's being clogged up at the Ontario Land Tribunal, appealing the, uh, a lot of it appealing the official plan, um, which uh, we are working through with, with our uh, development partners. I personally feel that we need to work with the development community through planning and not, not necessarily for them, but through planning and development uh, and enhance the opportunities for the development community. We are doing that. Reserves aren't great but they're healthy and we're rebuilding them. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Okay, it's good to move on to the next one. I mean, I know there's a lot more to be said, but anyway, that was good, good discussion. Okay, uh, number three. How should the cost of North Simcoe Sports Recreation Center 
user rates be divided among North Simcoe municipalities that use the Midlands faci uh, facility? Sorry. And we'll start this off with uh, Stuart. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I think it's important to know that uh, Midland residents have paid uh, down the debt on this facility to the tune of about $440,000 a year uh, for almost 25 years. You'll notice it's the North Simcoe Sports and Recreation Complex. Uh, it's actually funded by Midland residents for the most part. Uh, yet user fees uh, are the same for residents and non-residents. And I would suggest to you that what we need to do is to understand what the uh, the costs were for uh, to the, the Midland residents and provide a discount to them on a standard fee. The fee applies across the board, but the residents would see a, a discount. I think that's fair. I also suggest to you that uh, and Midland is engaging neighboring municipalities like Tiny, Penetang, Sheen, and Tay. And uh, not unlike what we're doing at the library, if you have a resident that comes in and is using our facility, then we will take down a name and address and we will send that over to our neighboring residents, uh, neighboring municipalities, beg your pardon, and they then will pay a fee that's negotiated based on, on the operating costs of the facility and, and, and also a contribution towards the capital, which it's, it's coming up to the point where it's being, getting a little tired and it's going to need some help. So uh, we can also get towards a, I believe, income derived from naming rights. Now you see this happening all over the place, whether it's the Sadlin Center or the Molson Center or the O'Keefe Center or whatever. And I think uh, these rights could be granted for a period of time. I think also Midland should, pro should, should approach uh, its neighboring user, uh, the Carling Club, and see what, what we can do to share costs, particularly with respect to ICE. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Uh, next, go to, uh, to Jack Conklin. How would the costs of North Simcoe Sports and Recreation Center user rates be divided? Oh, how should, sorry, the costs of North Simcoe County, uh, North Simcoe Sports and Recreation Center user rates be divided among the North Simcoe municipalities that use the Midland facility? Thank you. The rec center was designed to serve North Simcoe, hence the name. Unfortunately, not many of our neighbors see fit to contribute to the operating costs, even though their residents make good use of the facilities for youth, adult, and older adult programs. I think this is something that the North Simcoe municipalities need to look at seriously, just as they've had have with the Cultural Alliance in the heart of Georgian Bay and shared services delivery around the building and fire departments. We may find that we already have a pretty good reciprocal exchange of recreational services with our neighbors, but we won't know until we talk to them about it. Again, it comes down to communication. When we build the rec center, we had grants, we fundraised, and financed a large portion of it. It cost us nearly $450,000 every year to pay off the debt, and it's very close to being paid off, which will certainly help with the center's budget line. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Now, next we go to Cody. How should the cost of North Simcoe Sports and Recreation Center use rates be divided among the North Simcoe municipalities that use the Midland facility? Well, thank you. I feel we need to do a better job with income streams for the rec center in general. I agree with Mayor Strather and I'd love to see the grounded coffee center, or the mega mindful center. As the questions regarding neighboring municipalities, I'll stick to that point. I think we need to have a better conversation about the power of four, as we've been calling it, and put everything on the table and discuss who benefits from what and move the lines on a few things. All four municipalities have unique things that we bring to the table and all in one way or another benefit from being good neighbors, as good neighbors should. We could discuss user fees at the rec center, but I don't like to see further financial restraint on parents trying to get their kids into sports as costs ultimately get downloaded to them. We should be doing more to help with these financial restraints, in my opinion, work closer with groups like We Are The Villagers, Jumpstart, and other groups that have been working hard to make recreation more affordable for families who need it. I'd rather see the other municipalities give some trade-offs for the services that we provide to them at no additional cost. I'd love to see Tiny move the hard line and allow more Midland residents on their beaches. I'd love to see Tay Township become a partner with Penetang Machine, us and Tiny at the Heroni Airport. I'd like to keep working on partnerships with Penetang Machine, like our fire service partnership, transit, building department <clears throat> partnership to find more synergies. I'd say that we could share a rec center, but there's no way we convince the Midland and Penetang teams to play in the same arena. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Cody. And next, we go to Bill Gordon. 
How should the cost of North Simcoe Sports Recreation Center user rates be divided among North Simcoe municipalities that use the Midland facility? First off, I've heard rumblings from our staff who I talk to frequently about our senior team threatening to simply just sell off the Sports and Rec Center. Um, but you know, I want to remind everyone, this is a healthy rec center for people of all ages. Decades ago, there was shared funding to help build the Sports and Rec Center. Since then, the Midland Ratepayer has borne almost entirely the cost to operate this valuable recreational community asset. The early costs are estimated to be around a million dollars. This number seems high and is definitely deserving of a deeper dive by new council. In addition to operating costs, the building and its systems are aging and in need of repair and placement. Upgrades to make it more sustainable and environmentally friendly are also pressures that our budgets are going to face. It no longer really seems fiscally responsible to me to ask the Midland Repair to bear the entire cost alone while inviting neighbours and guests to use our facility without any equity stake in its operations. I would support two approaches in tandem. The first would be a deep dive into the operating costs of the facility and look for ways to operate it more economically without selling it. Uh, the second approach would be to explore reasonable, affordable and non-resident surcharges for, for those who use the facility contingent on a cost recovery alone, not with the mindset of profitability. I'd look for ways to reduce the fees for residents, our local residents, and have modest but reasonable increases for our neighbours and guests, helping to keep this facility operational, well-maintained, and providing excellent rec and community services to North Simcoe should be a goal shared equally by all of our municipalities. It can't remain the North Simcoe Sports and Recreation Centre in name alone. We can make it better and more affordable for all of us, but we need to do it together. Thank you, Bill. Uh, we'll next go to uh, Jonathan Main. How should the cost of North Simcoe Sports and Recreation Centre user rates be divided among the North Simcoe municipalities that use the minimum facility? Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, we struggled with this uh, in the, the budget last year, and we were looking at an astronomical 33% user rate increase, which is way above uh, the capacity of our community organizations. So I, I think what uh, Councillor uh, Obseski uh, uh, said was about shared services. I think that's a really key point. Midland, we have huge success with shared services, with Penetang and also Tiny and Tay, a variety of issues, uh, transit, uh, fire chief, building department, but rec services is a huge opportunity for Midland to partner with our neighboring municipalities because historically Midland doesn't do rec services. We have the hardware, we have the facilities and the community provides the uh, software or the, the programming, if you will. You know, amazing organizations like Ask Anonia, Boys and Girls Club. Uh, so we also could perhaps uh, review uh, looking at the Affordable Recreation Fund, which we had a small uh, nominal amount, which was basically uh, earmarked for the Boys and Girls club. Uh, of course, uh, revenue generation is also a, a great opportunity to reduce costs. So, you know, uh, Peggy Hill teams keeping it real and Barry, and we can be looking at other opportunities for the Midland uh, NSRC. NSRC. Also, community groups have said when we were discussing them that they would like to have greater opportunities for fundraising, make it easier for them to fundraise. The reality is many of these community groups do have to fundraise to pay for the costs and also the arena and the SRC is a very costly uh, facility to run because you have to heat it and cool at the same time. So we have to continue to look at energy efficient energy upgrades, perhaps even solar energy to try to reduce uh, the operating costs by generating energy or reducing energy loss. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. And finally, uh, for the question, we'll have uh, Uta. How should the cost of North Simcoe Sports and Recreation Center user rates be divided among the North Simcoe municipalities that use the Midland facility? Can you imagine if, if the surrounding townships wanted to, us to pay a tariff to use the hiking, cycling trails in Tiny and Tay? My goodness, I would not support user rates among the North Simcoe municipalities. This would alienate and imply that Midland residents don't benefit from the amenities offered in other municipalities in North Simcoe. Important progress will be made as we discuss sharing the expenses collectively of recreational services throughout North Simcoe in the same way that we are learning how to share police, fire, airport, and perhaps even down the road, library and museum services. Ensuring that all of our municipal, building, municipal buildings are energy efficient with solar and passive solar supports will reduce operational costs. Moving towards shared recreational staff supporting all of North Simcoe will also be a part of the solution that fairly represents the interdependent interests of a well-integrated North Simcoe region. Thanks, Uta. 
Uh, and now we'll go for the open discussion. And uh, Stuart, if you want to say any comments, if there's anything you want to add to anything you've heard from, uh, from the other candidates. Uh, thank you, Peter. I think it's important to point out that the municipalities, the four municipalities, are in fact already talking about how to share, share the cost, not only on the rec center, but also on a number of other areas. We've already sharing fire, transit, uh, and, um, and building department. We're looking at legal, we're looking at uh, all human resources and so on. In fact, the province paid for a study to look at that. So we're already looking at that. As far as the um, operating budget, we've had the opportunity to do a deep dive on the operating budget for the last four years and the four years prior to that. And what we find is that there are the, the, uh, the, the place where you're most likely to see a, a savings is probably in the rinks uh, in terms of the energy consumption that happens there. Heat loss in the facility, we might be able to look at that. Um, you, you, I would say, uh, are going to do that most likely with your neighbor, uh, the curling rink. Um, outside of that, I think that the place is well run. As I think Councillor Shevsky said, we, we provide the facility and the community pri provides the, the, uh, the programming. I think we can look to the other municipalities because they have some great examples of how to provide programming that we can learn from, and we'd be well served by doing that. But overall, I think the rec center, in terms of cost allocation, users are going to have to pay. Uh, do you want to bankrupt them to the point where they're, they're not going to be able to, uh, to participate? No. So it's a consultation. Bring the user groups in, have a, have a conversation. 33% in the last budget, nuts. So a little more reasonable approach to it, I think, is in order. Thanks, Stuart. Anyone else want to add anything to that, what's been said so far? Uh, Jonathan, and then we'll go to Bill. Thank you. Yeah, and, and there's so many great ideas for NSRC that really somebody needs to take, uh, you know, make it into a little plan of, you know, how we refresh and revitalize NSRC. Uh, I love when we get to have meetings at the community hall. I think that's a great venue, and there's a great opportunity to continue to invest in the facility and, and enhance the hall so it's uh, you know, fun and functional, and it can be a multi-use. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. The staff has such a great job, especially giving it a fresh paint, uh, coat of paint through the pandemic. Staff work really hard. And so I know how much people uh, admire and and desire a great rec services. And NSRC is is a uh, just a cornerstone of uh, rec facilities in Midland. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Bill? Thanks. Just a quick note that the bookings of the hall space at the Sports and Rec Center are way, way down. I mean, clearly during the pandemic, we could expect that, but we haven't recovered at the Sports and Rec Center. There's uh, been talk about eliminating the special occasion permit that we hold, so that would force anyone that rents the place to have to seek alcohol permits on their own rather than using the towns. Uh, that hasn't come to council yet. And there's also the reality that there are things we can do. Um, and and to, to, your, to your point, four years ago, when I was asked this question by, I think, well, I was at one of these meet and greets, I bristled just as you do to the thought of uh, charging our neighbors anything to use our facility. But sitting through four years of budgets as an election official and me having to cut and slice and dice things that are super near and dear to myself and the rest of the community just to keep the wheels on, uh, it's a reality pill. And it's one that, you know, I'm hoping one day you get the opportunity to experience because it really changes your perspective on service delivery and the costs. One of the things I would like to champion is something I saw down at the, at the AMO conference, and that's an energy audit and uh, grants that can put on a heat capture unit. So in the ice making, the byproduct of making the ice is heat, of course. And there are these devices that can go onto the massive chillers that capture that heat and then use that to offset our reliance on fossil fuels to heat things like the change room in the facility. So I think there's a lot of room for looking for um, enhanced ways to try and cut our operating costs Become, you know, reduce our carbon footprint, be more energy efficient and, and environmentally conscious. And these are all things that I'd be looking to um, look over for the next term with council, assuming I had their support in it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Anyone else want to add to that? We're good? Okay, perfect. We'll go on to question number four. What plans do you have to increase the walkability and pedestrian safety in Midland? And we'll start this off with uh, Jack. Oh, you're mute, Jack. Okay. There you go. Sorry about that. I don't know. It must have no, no problem. 
Okay, so as I was saying, the town of Midland has a serious issue with speeding on its roadways. I have heard from many people while door knocking that there is a real fear for children and adults while crossing streets or walking on sidewalks. Cook's Drive residents were recently successful in having a safety zone declared, therefore, thereby reducing speed limits and increasing fines for delinquents. I expect that more neighborhoods will be making similar appeals soon. It was interesting to hear some of the traffic calming suggestions that council brought back from AMO this year. It sounds like we are not alone in this, these issues. About the, I've also heard about the serious concerns about the courtesy crosswalks where cars have the right of way, but we are asking them to stop out of courtesy for the pedestrian. Some drivers are just not that polite. Of course, we need to have appropriate enforcement by OPP and good communications with them and our residents about steps we can take to slow drivers down. We all need to work together to find various solutions for different streets and roads in town. I want to take preventative measures to curtail speeding in our town. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Uh, next, we'll go to Cody. What plans do you have to increase the walkability and pedestrian safety in Midland? Thank you. I think John's going to need 10 minutes for this one. <laughs> Uh, I think we've been doing a great job establishing some community safety zones. Uh, as Jack just mentioned, uh, Cook Drive was just a few weeks ago. Reducing speed limits and increasing fines in problematic areas. I think we could drop most of the town's speed limit down to 40 kilometers an hour, aside from the main veins of King, William, Young, Hugo, etc. I believe we should continue the bike lane network to fill the gaps and make it safer to share the streets with cyclists. I would like to see better speed enforcement, especially in school zones. I love some of the initiatives the downtown have taken with their alleys. Fresh paint, some art displays, well lit, and a much safer feeling than they were prior to. We could do a better job making our trail network safer and more welcoming as well. And sometimes safety means accessibility. I think we need to do a better job making sure our events are accessible, and we need to do a better job running things through our accessibility committee for review and make the necessary changes to ensure that everyone is able to enjoy every part of our town and all of our events. Lastly, I think we could improve our transit system to make up the walkability gaps. It's extremely important to me that our residents and our guests feel safe uh, when on our streets and trails network. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. Next, go to Bill Gordon. What plans do you have to increase the walkability and pedestrian safety in Midland? Thank you. Safety is always a top priority for me, and with the dramatic increase in costs of our insurance, should always be top of mind for this municipality. There are several challenges we face that impact walkability and pedestrian safety, the first of which is being things like keeping our sidewalks in good repair and getting them cleared in the wintertime in a timely manner. We do seem to struggle with this challenge largely due to staffing or machines being offline and perhaps even lack of capacity, and yet we keep building more sidewalks. Turning to declaring snow emergencies, which was once unheard of, are now being used to justify failing to meet the legislative minimum maintenance standards. This can't be a tool that we use routinely and, to, and you know, to continue our failure to be able to keep our sidewalks cleared in the wintertime. I'd also like to see our bylaws more proactively enforced and get adults on bicycles and e-bikes off of our sidewalks and onto the roads and bike lanes where they belong. The multi-use trails and the new bylaw that allows pedal exit e-bikes but bans fully electric e-bikes needs review and attention to make sure that it's having the intended impact despite our lack of ability to enforce the changes. I'd also like to see the end of those uncontrolled courtesy crosswalks where children and residents literally take their lives in their own hands by attempting to cross busy roadways with nothing but a sign and some paint between them and increasingly distracted drivers. Automated speed enforcement options are available to the municipalities now with the ability to funnel the, the and capture the cost from those tickets into the municipalities' reserves, specifically aimed for projects like more uh, traffic calming. As we push for more walkability and active transportation in our community, we must take steps to ensure that it can be done safely affordably and year round. Thank you, Bill. Uh, next, go to Jonathan. What plans do you have to increase the walkability and pedestrian safety in Midland? Thank you. I feel like this question was written just for me. Uh, this has been something that I've been advocating wholeheartedly since 2014, both terms of council, advocating for a multimodal transportation plan, which we've enacted. So uh, the future of transportation is multimodal. And uh, 
Midland has a robust sidewalk network. We're at about 100 kilometers, but we still have gaps all across our community, Dominion Street, Victoria Street, even Aberdeen. So we're going to have to continue to connect our sidewalk network to continue to promote pedestrian safety. Our cycling, cycling network is a work in progress. Obviously, we have an incredible trail system, but we have a huge opportunity to connect on and off street infrastructure to connect our downtown to a little lake and other uh, on street corridors. But we also have to make sure that they're protected and separated. So when people are cycling, they're comfortable and they're safe. Uh, one of the biggest things that's gonna make a huge impact is pedestrian crossings. We're days away from two pedestrian crosswalks being installed in Midland, one at uh, Mondays Bay at Young Street and Six and Bayshore uh, at Midland Avenue. And if we can do two a year for the next couple of years, that would make uh, be so amazing, especially William and Elizabeth at Sacred Heart. That's a high demand, high uh, intersection area, which would be greatly uh, appreciated. Complete Street 93 was a huge success. Obviously, the sidewalk on one side, but the pathway all the way to Penetanguishene has created a huge corridor that we continue to build and extend to Mount Bomb Beach or uh, uh, Golf Link and Binden. So we have so much opportunity to continue and expand our active transportation network. We've also been very successful at the committee level to identify small little quick wind type projects. Hugel and Cook is a great example of a small little pathway with some crushed limestone. So it's accessible, but it's low cost. And then, you know, people have fun with it and they try to plant pollinators and create a little pollinator pathway. Traffic calming policy is a policy that I advocated in my first okay. term of council. Jonathan, oh, I gotta sorry. cut you off. Yeah, sorry, no, you not do well. Bell, but traffic yeah, calming. No, that, no, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, sorry, yeah. No, you did well, you lot said. Yeah, um, sorry, yeah. I knew I was gonna run long on that one. No, no, we were warned by Cody, so that's fine. No, no that's good. Um, next, we'll go to uh, Uta. What plans do you have to increase the walkability and pedestrian safety in Midland? Well, we need more allocated and protected cycling lanes in Midland. Our entry-level workers in Midland will not own or drive cars will arrive at their jobs either on foot, by cycle, or on public transit. I walked to my high school uh, job at the Midland Library for five years, for example. Um, we must invest in walkable neighborhoods by recognizing and expanding our current business hubs on William Street, on Woodland Drive, on Young Street, and Vinden Street. As residents walk to these business hubs, accessing services like uh, a weekly evening farmer's market, a variety store that sells produce, baked goods and, uh, and a basic hardware supplies, a hairdresser, a computer repair shop, uh, medical services, a restaurant and a local gathering place, we will experience a revitalization of families safely living and socializing right in their own walkable neighborhoods. Walkable neighborhoods mean eyes on the street and better communication with the town on issues that need addressing. Residents walking and cycling and using assisted mobility devices will improve community health uh, as a whole. Um, when we are reducing our speed limits to 40 kilometers an hour, that's essential. I think we all agree on reducing the speed limits here in Midland, and I think that would be a good plan, and it's essential in creating much safer neighborhoods for all of us. I would actually bargain, because I'm used to bargaining and compromise, I would bargain for 30 kilometers and may maybe hope that we settle at 3540. That would be my way of approaching that. Okay, thank you, Tim. And uh, we'll close it up with uh, Stuart Strathern. What plans do you have to increase the walkability and pedestrian safety in Midland? First of all, I'd like to say that uh, I agree with John Main that we have a patchwork of sidewalks. It's quite extensive, but it is a patchwork. All new developments should be required to produce sidewalks. I differ in how you would do that. I would suggest that you put it at the back of the lot, separate it from the road network, so that you're actually accessing a walkway that's protected by houses. You see this in England all the time. It's very effective. It's a great way to get to your, your back shop, not the high street or the main street. So it's whether it's, uh, it's so that, and the high shops, as you get into planning, you plan them into the neighborhoods so that you, you, you've got a complete, complete community on a neighborhood basis. As far as speeding, we, uh, Forest Street is a great example of treatments for speeding. We have put in, uh, we've narrowed the road, We've reduced the speed limit, and still we have accidents at Hugel and Forth. And really what it amounts to is driver's attitude. Uh, you, we can put enforcement in there till the cows come home. So either we alter 
driver's behavior. And I would suggest that the way you do that is by getting a hold of the province and saying, make it very costly for these people to speed. That, to me, this is ubiquitous. It's across all municipalities. We do have uh, street light software. We can actually ring fence or geofence different parts of the community and understand the driver's behavior by time of day, direction, speed, and so on. And that is now being applied. I think Councillor Gordon was pointed out there are now tools for uh, uh, ra photo radar and so on. I think we have uh, an opportunity here to really take control. We are putting crosswalks in, and that's a, a great first step. But I think you need to move people away from the traditional sidewalk model, something more akin to what happens in the UK. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. And uh, that's great. Now we'll go to the open discussion. Um, and Jack, did you want to add anything from what you've heard uh, from the other candidates? Uh, not right now. I think what we need to look at is the, the issue that people have in the community about the speeding. That's a big, big problem, uh, whether it's uh, 4th Street, whether it's William Street, uh, whether it's uh, Midland Point Road. I've heard when I was door knocking, these are big, big problems. But I think if there was a plan with Jonathan said, I mean, I would support a transportation plan, build it in with other communities to find out what they're doing and do a, a, a reference check to see how we could build our own uh, issues to solve those problems of speeding and have more uh, safety for our children uh, walking this, uh, the sidewalks. Thank you, Jack. Does anything else want to add anything to that? Uh, Bill, and then we'll go John, Jonathan. Thanks. I just want to toss in uh, Sacred Heart School as of, as of late has been the subject of much conversation as they struggle with syringes and drug paraphernalia in their yards daily, along with mischief to their playground and theft. This plays out in many other parts of our community, but I'm just focusing on this one right now. We need to press our OPP policing partners for more proactive patrols or any proactive patrols in our community. We were promised police in Midland as part of the contract, but the reality is that we're routinely left without any presence, any presence unless an emergency call is made. Community policing requires police presence in our community to proactively patrol neighborhoods, enforce our speed limits, and manage problem areas with targeted enforcement on offenders as well as well-known drug houses. I plan to be working closely with our police services board uh, because I understand the business of policing intimately after spending a quarter century in it and working with our partners to try and make Zone 5 or Midland a priority in their policing mandate. Thank you, Bill. We'll go to Jonathan, and then I saw Stuart go after that. Uh, what's my time? I'm just kidding. Uh, well, uh, we got to... <laughs> um, so one one tool that's been really uh, popular uh, in North American cities uh, is Vision Zero. It's mostly based off a Nordic, uh, Sweden, Norway model of really trying to get uh, accidents and, and vehicle and uh, pedestrian injuries down to zero. Uh, but it's a total rethink of our roadways. A lot of protection would go into that. And so you've seen other municipalities looking at protected intersections to continue to protect vulnerable road users, which now is the term for walkers and cyclists. Um, so that's an important thing that we can review. Complete streets is now integrated into our official plan. Um, also huge shout out to Askinonia Senior Center and they have walking clubs. I mean, walking as a recreation also addresses social isolation, but it's great to see people uh, in Little Lake Park all the time. Uh, but a key policy that we're looking at in partnership with the health unit is active, uh, active school routes to try to continue to promote uh, kids walking to school, cycling to school, and that just if you teach them at a young age, increase their uh, mobility, increase their confidence, uh, health benefits. And so those are types of programs that we're partnering with and trying to implement as, uh, and roll that out from, uh, from school to school to school. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay, Stuart. I'm muted. Well, thank you. you. Yes, thank you. I'd just like to point out that uh, since the OPP came to town, they have taken down over 50 dealers. They've taken 25 to 30 guns off the street. I don't know how much in the way of drugs and cash. The problem, though, is that they, they do the arrest, they make the charges, they take them up to the court, and the JP at the court lets people back out. Within 24 hours, they're back on the street. Now, that's got to be hugely demoralizing to the community street crimes unit that's 
performing these tasks, uh, not to mention the citizens who file complaints and understand that these these people are up to no good. And frankly, it undermines the, the people's uh, 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 you know their their um, faith in the in the uh, criminal justice system. The the problem seems to lie that at the in the court system, they're just dropping charges, they're downgrading charges to the point where these people are laughing. So I would suggest to you that it's not the policing. It is in fact, it is in fact the federal attorney general and to a lesser extent the provincial attorney general. And I know that there are a lot of municipalities who are very, very fed up with this and, and are now working through their MPs. I'm working through MP Chambers. He's taking the federal minister to task regularly, and we hope to see some results out of that. The emphasis is not, the, the policing is happening. It's at the criminal justice system further up the food chain. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Uh, Uta, did you have something to say? I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, um, my comment was it was going to be about the way we've designed our neighborhoods in the last few decades. I would say from the '80s on, our subdivisions have been designed, and they and they haven't been they haven't been using the, the the model of inclusionary housing. If you look at the older neighborhoods in Midland that were built in the '50s and the '60s, you see two blocks, and every two blocks you see a multi-level um, housing model like a, a walk up with two or three floors and, and you do not see this in any of the new housing developments in Midland that have come up in the last few years um, the last decades actually so we built neighborhoods with a commuter in thought instead of people engaging in their neighborhoods um, as I said again there are these neighborhood hubs that have formed um, Young Street is a, is a primary cons example of that where we have the Dairy Queen um, we have the uh, what was once Garm's um, auto service, I think, would be a great place to put uh, cycling, a cycling service, as well as a, a repair shop for scooters and, and electric devices. And there's already a little bakery there and the hairdresser and, and, a, and a little medical service there. We are finding these little hubs forming all across this, the city. I'd say at least four distinct ones that are that are definitely creating personalities. So that'll make your neighborhoods walkable and that'll make your people out and about and speeders won't want to hang out. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Uta. Uh, that's pretty much it. Is anything really quick to say? Really quick couple of comments. You're good. Okay. We'll move on to the next question. It's a long question. I'll, I'll read it all and I'll shorten it afterwards. Number five. In the past decade, Midland has lost many hectares of urban woodlands, developers, and many more are planned to be paved, paved over. We now see the waterfront going down the same path. Do you believe that residents need more access to urban woodlands and the water with better availability of public beaches and accessible waterfront? And uh, we'll start uh, with Cody. Thank you very much. Uh, of course I do. I think we need to do a better job at getting some of the parks back to a higher standard, uh, Little Lake Park particularly. Uh, beautiful flower beds, well-maintained, clean and safe pavilions that you'd want to get married in or attend an exercise class, a bit of camping so our residents can camp right here in town with the kids without having to travel, and visitors from out of town can bring their families here too. We have some hidden gems that, that we need to do a better job sharing with our residents. We own 50% of a 300-acre airport with Penetanguishene and Tiny, uh, located in Tiny, that I believe, I, I would bet, the majority of the public have never been to. It has so much to offer. Uh, we have waterfront outdoor shuffleboard court on town property, primarily used by one group. We have an amazing 18-hole frisbee golf course, pickleball, tennis courts, baseball diamonds that could be better utilized. Uh, we should be marketing our town to our residents, and we should focus as much on it as we do on tourism. The tone of the question suggests that the town is selling off public access to the waterfront, and I want to say very clearly that I would not approve any development that reduced public access to Georgia Bay. I've seen the plans for phase one Midland Bay Landing and I'm excited for the upgrade to the waterfront and 100% access, public access to the water's edge. I know there's been a lot of misinformation flowing around, but I'm not going anywhere. And if re-elected, I will be held fully accountable for voting to support phase one of the development. This will put us in a better financial position to better maintain and promote the other assets we do have. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Cody. Next, go to Bill Gordon. And I'll just read the second half of the question. Do you believe that residents need more access to urban woodlands and the water with better availability of public beaches and accessible waterfront? Short answer is heck yeah. Parkland preservation is what got me into politics in the first place after the struggles to stop the severing of Edgehill Park for commercial development. That one's for Derek Howard. 
I don't uh, judge the worthiness of public green space by its daily use and will continue to fight for the preservation of our parklands and waterfront. There is another question tonight, though, the final one that speaks specifically to Midland Bay landing waterfront development. So I'm going to save my main comments for that response. In general terms, Midland is blessed with a lush urban tree canopy and parkettes. Access to Little Lake Park, our second biggest natural asset next to Midland Bay Landing, is a shadow of its former self. With some care and attention and some money, it can be revitalized to one of the two main sources of water access and recreation in our community. The pandemic's impacts on our mobility have heightened our awareness and desire to enjoy outdoor rec in national, natural settings. This change in perspectives and priorities needs to be reflected in our policies and planning as we move into our comprehensive review of our zoning bylaw next term. The need to access our waterways, especially Georgian Bay, must be preserved and enhanced so that residents and visitors alike, regardless of their affluence, have equal access to our waterfront shoreline parks and woodlands. Our bay is almost mostly privately rimmed with luxury waterfront residents now, and preserving what's left of our Georgian Bay access for everyone must take precedent over the lure of quick capital from land sales, development charges, and property taxes. You've heard it before, but it's worth repeating. It's wildly irresponsible and incredibly short-sighted to pave paradise and put in a parking lot. Thank you, Bill. Uh, next, we'll go to Jonathan Main. Do you believe that residents need more access to urban wetlands and water with better availability of public beaches and accessible waterfront? Uh, thanks. This is a great question. It's kind of a two-part question about talking about trees and tree canopy and the second about access to water. So a uh, huge proponent, supporter of sustainable development. Midland is kind of in the crosshairs of the growth plan of the province. We're being allocated growth. So we're going to have to be very smart and uh, very sensible and sustainable at how we develop Midland. So I think there is legitimate concern about the forest on the periphery of the community. And that's why our official plan integrated natural heritage designation and natural heritage system to try to protect and create policies so that we can have sustainable growth. Again, intensification is going to be uh, really key uh, to try to uh, prevent sprawl or, or peripheral development. And I've been a huge advocate for, and it looks like it's on the verge of happening, is an urban tree management plan. Uh, we need more street trees, uh, not just for beautification, not just for stormwater management, uh, but for all the different environmental benefits and economic benefits that it does. We have a lot of dying ash trees in our community. Uh, from emerald ash borer, invasive species, also invasive species like Manitoba maple, uh, glossy buckthorn, but also our mature trees are dying and crumbling and windstorms are shredding our trees to pieces. So huge focus on planting new trees, streets, and on parks. And our parks plan uh, has a great uh, plan to try to create more access to the waterfront. Pete Peterson and the old piers, you know, there's some renderings about how you can continue to improve access. Uh, our accessibility committee uh, advocated for a Moby mat, uh, so allow for people with wheelchairs to access the water. Uh, and so that also is going to have a huge question around water quality. And we're going to have to work with SSEA and trying to promote and uh, heal uh, the, the little lake because it, it's kind of a canary in a coal mine. It's really signaling that it's uh, a little lake in, in distress. And so it's really important that we uh, continue to try to improve the health of our water bodies. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Next, we go to Uta. Do you believe that residents need more access to urban woodlands and the water with better availability of public beaches and accessible waterfront? After last evening's uh, mayoral debate, <laughs> I needed a good walk in the forest to get through that one. Boy, did I ever. That's where I go when I need to make peace with reality. <laughs> So paved services are not natural, though I do advocate for boardwalks as they provide access for those with mobility challenges. I think it, when our children are walking on concrete and pavement all the time, forget that we are, we are made of natural stuff. We are made of the very same thing that plants and soil are made of. Uh, providing cost-effective public transportation to Little Lake Park, Pete Peterson Park, conservation areas, provincial parks, the Y Marsh, and North Simcoe Forests and hiking trails should be a part of our development plans. Developing and maintaining a hiking trail around Little Lake Park could also be on our radar. Lifelong fitness includes several elements, cardiovascular health, muscle maintenance, and flexibility. We could create urban hike circuits with, with uh, station stops that include simple exercise suggestions, historical and heritage information, about the stop site and requests for public engagement to make urban walking routes mild, moderate, challenging, more accessible and fun. Uh, 
Uh, we could introduce seasonal changes, urban geocaching, uh, plant identification passports, and other creative opportunities that use smartphone technology for residents to interact with and assist in gathering community data about urban infrastructure, flora, and fauna. Thanks, Uta. Uh, next, we'll go to Stuart Strathern. Do you believe that residents need more access to urban woodlands and the water with better availability of public beaches and accessible waterfront? Absolutely. And residents do have that. We have um, about uh, 360 acres of parkland currently. 26 of those, uh, uh, sorry, I put my glasses on while I'm reading numbers here. I'll get it wrong. 11 of these parks are waterfronts. Uh, we have two, th uh, three community parks, uh, including uh, Tiffin, uh, Little Lake, uh, and Edge Hill. Each of them are slightly different. Tiffin Park is a natural woodland. It's public property. You can go in there. There are no trails. It's, it's the nat a very natural space. Uh, we have quite a variety. We have smaller spaces that we're turning into uh, to pollinator uh, friendly uh, parks through uh, the creation of uh, wildflower uh, plantings and so on, simply because uh, the cost to operate some of these things just as uh, we can't do that. So we need to focus on the parks that give us the best return. We have people using in behind uh, the uh, Mountain View Mall consistently. Uh, there is uh, There are proposals to develop back there. They, as, as Councillor Main suggested, the natural heritage designation will make sure that we take into account the natural heritage features that are important there while still allowing for meaningful development and continuing to allow people to use those facilities. As far as uh, new parks and trails master plan, there's approximately uh, 10.5 million in, in the works for park redevelopment, new parks, trails, and of course it identified Sunnyside as being particularly uh, in need of a new park. So. Um, I think that uh, also these these uh, things that we've talked about don't include the 3,700 feet of accessible shoreline along Middle Bay Landing, right from the water's edge back 100 feet. Never before really accessible other than through uh, trespass or for those who were adventurous enough to go in there. So thank you for that. Thanks, Drew. And to, uh, to wrap up the question, uh, we have Jack. Uh, the answer is yes. Midland has few public beaches, such as Collie Park, Pete Peterson Park, and Little Lake Park. All are plagued with water quality issues at some point during the summer months. I've heard that some residents would like to have a means of transportation to the beaches, and this is something we could look at if there's a demand. Little Lake Park has a beautiful red oak savanna forest something we need to maintain for its good health and aesthetics. When developments require the cleaning of urban woodlands, we should insist that they replant as soon as possible and use only native species. Midland Bay Landing is one of the upcoming developments that may limit access to the water for residents. I support revisiting the decade-old plan before the final documents are signed, so we will listen to the community and ensure we are making sound decisions. We need to ensure that the public space is enough, usable, and in the best location. It's about conservation and having access to the water. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jack. Um, and now we'll go to the uh, you know open uh, part of the question. Uh, and we'll start with Cody. Is there anything you want to add, Cody, to uh, what was said? Well, I don't think I have anything to add to that. I think uh, I summed my opinion up uh, pretty thoroughly. I think uh, what we can do a better job at is marketing um, our parks better to our community. I think if you ask Midland residents to name 10 parks, they'd probably have a hard time doing that. Everyone knows the Pedersen Park, Little Lake Park, Tiffin Park, but we have some really uh, beautiful parks that um, are hidden gems. And... Um, um, I think that we need to encourage the public more so to see these other parks and uh, so we can capitalize on on having them. We have them, we maintain them, we might as well be using them. So I think we need to do a better job of communicating that to the public. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Cody. Anyone else want to add? Yes, Bill? And then uh, Jonathan? Thanks, I'd just like to, I mean, it was briefly touched on about our no-mo and pollinator-friendly zones. I think the pollinator-friendly zone idea, and it's, I mean, it's not a bad idea, but I think we haven't done anything with it. 
Um, they should be tilled and seeded with wildflowers. It's absolutely beautiful where you see communities have done this. We need to work towards maybe another communities in bloom victory. The last one was quite some time ago. We really need to clean up our town and focus on property standards, which have really fallen by the wayside. We have many, many enthusiasts in our community that would love to help us get the town back in shape. And quite frankly, our no-mo zones, especially along Bayshore, just makes the town look unkept. Uh, tall grasses are tick havens and they're not for pollinators. So I just think we need to revisit the policy and our implementation and try to beautify our town rather than just neglecting uh, mowing for the sake of neglecting mowing. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Jonathan, I saw you up. Yeah, uh, Bill, uh, beat me to the punch there. That was what I was going to say is about communities in bloom. Uh, we had that in our strategic plan for the last term to try to uh, reapply, and then we got sideswiped with the pandemic. I, I very much uh, think that the community in bloom uh, initiative is, is a great initiative to try to uh, to achieve our best potential. And Midland is so beautiful, especially if you go to Little Lake Park at the end of May. You hit the right week with all the cherry blossom, which are actually crab apple trees. Uh, you know, there's great opportunity for special events, but it's just Midland is so beautiful that we just keep having to add more biomass and plants and pollinators and trees, big and small, a uh, huge opportunity for Midland uh, to enhance our uh, tree canopy. Thank you. Uh, yes, Jack. Yes, I just wanted, to, <clears throat> excuse me, I just wanted to talk about uh, the UNESCO Geo Park. Uh, there are opportunities that will be emerging in conservation tourism. I think we need to seriously look at our parks and park system here in town and see if there's a way we can look at generating a conservation tour or associated with the development with the UNESCO Geo Park. And a lot of the communities uh, around Georgian Bay will be also looking at this because to attract new visitation and then have pride that brings pride to our community but the other aspect i'd like to just speak on just a bit is we need to do something about downtown uh bringing the flower beds back to life again uh, it, it's to me it, it's an eyesore i think we need to bring that to full bloom Think about the pun, but <laughs> bring it back so we have community pride. And that's part of the aspect of uh, how people see our community. So just a, uh, just upgrading the flower beds downtown will go a long way. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jack. I saw Stuart, and then we'll go to Uta. Thank you, Peter. Uh, just a uh, reach out to, to Mary, who does the gardens in the downtown. I think you're doing a great job uh, and uh, keep up the great work. Uh, there's, she's just done a, a gateway uh, feature out there at 12 and 93. Looks beautiful. Great job, Mary. I also want to point out that uh, Midland will be receiving 50 acres of uh, woodland and shoreline at the south end of Middle Lake as a result of the season's developments. Uh, there will be a network of trails, uh, uh, boardwalks, uh, Yes, they do provide accessibility along the water that's not there, and it will help to build the trail around Little Lake, as uh, Uda has just uh, suggested. There's a potential other 50 acres, which is uh, an Indigenous site, which we may come to the town. We have a significant number of natural assets, to Councillor Shevsky's point. Uh, yes, we probably should do a better job. I doubt many people know that Sunrise Park exists, for example, at the bottom of Curry Avenue. You never see anybody there, so I have to assume they don't know. But overall, I think the municipality has a, a good balance of natural assets that uh, if we were to be able to deal with the goose poop, which is probably a bigger problem than any outflow from our sewage system, frankly, we'd have a much better waterfront and more and more accessible. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Uh, Uta? You know, I, I wanted to point out to, Mr., uh, to Mayor Strathern that... Uh, if he was following me on social media, he would see that I am an avid photographer and that I am out photographing in all of our parks in Midland, uh, you from, from insects to flowers. And now of course we're in mushroom season. Uh, I don't pick mushrooms. I just photograph them because I think they're beautiful. And uh, there are a lot of people who, who are amazing photographers in this community. We, we've been inspired by some of the best, Bud Watson and Michael Odess. And if you could just highlight our work and support our work on social media uh, as politicians, we would, you know, if you, uh, if you could just like what we do, we would really be able to spread the word through social media how amazing our parks are. We're trying, we're bringing the time. 
Uh, thanks, Uta. Uh, just as a, as, a, as a plug for the chamber, there's always a chamber if you want to uh, promote your uh, local town. We're always here. Anyway, anyone else want to say anything else to that question? No, we're good. Okay. And number six, from a tourism perspective, marketing and promotion of Midland is non-existent. Is there any plan to drive tourism and improve our visibility? And we'll start this with uh, Bill Gordon. Thanks. I would suggest that tourism or promotion of Midland is far from non-existent. However, the fact that this perspective is held, even if by a minority of our community, it earns us an F on that communications report card. So the efforts of the EDC and S, both in North Simcoe and at the county, along with the Midland Tourism Office, the BIA, your office, the Chamber, and the efforts through Ontario Tourism are all very active in promoting Midland as a destination for arts, arts culture and recreation, and a getaway from the concrete jungle, quite frankly. Many of our new residents that I met this term in while knocking on doors cite our small town charm, proximity to Georgian Bay, water access, our trails, and our woodland setting as primary attractors for their decision to visit here and ultimately move. There's still much work to do, I agree, uh, and it bothers me that Midland loses money on things like hosting the butter tart, that's how do we do that, and that we have to pay organizers like uh, for events like Ribfest to come in our community, put fences up, all the vendors are theirs with the exception of one rooted, and uh, all the profits leave town when they do, and we lack the ability to measure with any certainty the economic impact of these events. So I'd like to see our tourism staff focus on building more homegrown events like Ribfest, where our own local restaurants could face off and build on the growing cruise ship visits to our community, which requires further collaboration and maybe even expansion of our BIA. We have a real opportunity with our waterfront to reconsider the development into something naturally spectacular in line with our UNESCO Geopark bid, preserving the small town charm, but celebrating our heritage. That's gonna take time, funding, and the shared vision of our community as we rebrand ourselves as a premier public access four season recreational hub on the shores of Georgian Bay. Okay, thank you, Bill. And next we go to Jonathan. From a tourism perspective, marketing and promotion of Midland is non-existent. Is there any plan to drive tourism and improve our visibility? Sure, yeah. Um, interesting question come from the chamber who used to administer our tourism in the 90s, but uh, it's a collaborative effort, right? And as people have said, uh, Midland is a four season destination and we continue having to focus on, on that. So we have, we bring uh, cyclists, cycle tourists, uh, downtown and our special events, uh, boats of all shapes and sizes. And of course, skiing and snowmobiling are popular uh, activities in Midland. Uh, Midland tourism has done a great job over the last many years, partnering with Simcoe Tourism and the new organization is North Simcoe Tourism, which is under the Economic Development Corporation North Simcoe umbrella. Uh, it also requires us to strengthen and enhance our digital brand. Uh, social media is uh, obviously a great tool that the Chamber does a great job at, the Business Improvement Area, uh, the Town of Midland, and we're actually actively working on a new website, and that helps towards our digital brand as well, having an accessible website for Midland. Uh, it helps towards tourism. Uh, Ontario's Best Butter Tart Festival is award-winning. Anytime you go anywhere and you t tell somebody you're from Midland, they say Butter Tart Festival. And so it's a huge success. And we saw this year, it bounced back spectacularly. So that's something to be uh, mindful of as we plan for events, big and small. It's not necessarily tourism driven. It's mostly events for us, but it will draw people from outside of town to visit our beautiful, lovely uh, community. We have great opportunities for special events and open street events, downtown, our little lake and our park system, waterfront in our town dock, and also Midland, uh, we are so blessed with our uh, neighboring uh, tourism and cultural assets that we've been doing a great job with uh, tourism in the last many years. Thank you. I think Jonathan. Let's go to Uta. From a tourism perspective, Marketing and promotion of Midland is non-existent. Is there any plan to drive tourism and improve our visibility? So from the massive uh, regional turnout to Ontario's Best Butter for Tart Festival and the 2022 Tall Ships event in Midland Harbour, I would say that we are marketing and promoting our region quite well when it comes to festivals. Where we may be struggling is marketing our local venues during the off seasons. Promotion of eco-tourism is essential. Close off at least one large section of Midland's downtown core and install playground equipment for children and adults in the street space. Build a teaching greenhouse downtown that provides recreation, education, and volunteer opportunities for residents. A natural meetup location which 
would give relief for those who struggle with seasonal darkness and uh, food security for our community pantries during the winter months. A community greenhouse is a great equalizer that brings people together to work on a project without stigma. Midland can do better at creating Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok moments for local and regional bloggers. Usually invite them to events, then engage by reposting their social media coverage of those events. Um, perhaps it's time for a new Midland Committee marketing promotion. Uh, I'm going to agree with, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll state that later on when we have the debate part. Sorry. <laughs> thanks. Okay, thanks, Uta. Uh, we'll next go to, to Stuart. From a tourism perspective, marketing and promotion of Midland is non-existent. Is there any plan to drive tourism and improve our visibility? Oh, you're muted. I think after two years, I know where the mute button was. Uh, like House from Maine, I find it odd that the preface to this question is being put out there by the chambers, given that the chamber is one of the partners in, in actually promoting the town and doing a good job. Thank you. Uh, the what, tour, Tourism Action Plan was uh, set up in 2010. It became part of the mandate of Economic Development uh, Corporation or Simcoe. Uh, through that uh, Economic Development Corporation, they created a DMO, Heart of Georgian Bay, with a direct marketing organization. They put out a brochure, the Heart of Georgian Bay, which I don't know whether you can see that or not, but very effective. It's getting wide distribution. Uh, subsequently, they partnered through a subcommittee of the BDCNS with Tourism Simcoe, which gave them huge uh, um, return on their dollar, the dollar that the Simcoe, North Simcoe municipalities were putting in. We get a communications group down there. They're uh, giving us access, not only provincially, nationally, but internationally in terms of, and, and through digital marketing and, and all the uh, social media outlets. We also uh, basically, uh, this town anchored the Great Lakes Cruise uh, business cruising business plan. Uh, we recently, four weeks ago, had the uh, president of Brits Carlton here. He's looking to make Midland a terminus. Uh, he, he was here for an hour, then he had to go buy two more cruise ships. Why is he doing that? Well, as it turns out, the, uh, the, the Great Lakes is, uh, is, is, is a favorite destination and river tourism is drying up. I would point out that the uh, County Economic Development uh, Committee funded the geopark through the Middle Bay Landing Development Corporation, got us to the point where we're an aspiring geopark. And as I understand it, uh, Mr. Conton is now part of that, that organization. And finally, the Cultural Alliance, which is again, the, the power of four plus one, power of four and more in terms of getting culture uh, assets mapped and then uh, out to the broader community. So we're doing a good job. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, I, I should say that, uh, yeah, we, we, we ask questions even if they do criticize the chamber. So we're, <laughs> we're open to, to any criticism and, and uh, hits that we can we have to give or take. Um, anyway, we'll go now to uh, Jack Conton. From a tourism perspective, marketing and promotion of Midland is not existent. Is there any plan to drive tourism and improve our visibility? Thank you. I believe we need to connect to the Regional Tourism Organization 7 and the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sports and, and Simcoe County Tourism. As a community, we need to concentrate on bringing our partners in accommodations, attractions and events together. We need to enhance marketing by selling tourism packages and arrange for a licensed accredited partner to sell these packages. This opens the door for the travel trade industry for independent and family-oriented travelers. Midland has the Cultural Alliance of Georgian Bay assisting in promoting culture around the Bay. The heart of Georgian Bay is a strong brand that promotes the gateway to the 30,000 islands. With the development of the UNESCO Geopark, Midland can develop and promote conservation tourism and possibly be the host site for a clearing house on the Georgian Bay Geopark. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Next we go to Cody. From a tourism perspective, marketing and promotion of Midland is non-existent. Is there a plan to drive tourism and improve our visibility? Thank you very much. I certainly don't agree that uh, tourism marketing is non-existent. I think the pandemic certainly changed uh, our tune a bit. Uh, prior to that, we had events every weekend and people were travel traveling from all over to come here. We had some great momentum going in uh, 
to the pandemic. Uh, we established the EDCNS, as uh, Mary Strathain said, with the Heart of Georgia Bay. Uh, they've just relocated downtown as well. The Culture Alliance uh, is active and well. Both, I feel, are doing a great job in regaining some momentum as we uh, are able to have events and visitors again. I think unique events are what drive people here, and I would love to see the events that I previously ran. Floaty Fest, Jaws on the Lake, uh, the Midland Beatles Fest uh, have a chance of making a comeback. The Jaws on the Lake event was our most liked, commented on, and shared social media post since Midland has got on social media. We need to keep the great events flowing like butter tarts, ribs, tugboats, tall ships, and I think we need to better fund our Canada Day and Winterfest events, hopefully through grants and creative income streams. I'd love to see Party on the Dock come back or other similar waterfront con uh, concert events. The fact that people are spending thousands of dollars to get on a cruise ship and getting dropped off on our waterfront tells me we're doing something right. And we just started doing that in the last few years. We've been a well-known destination for years. Can we do better? Absolutely. I'm a Midland cheerleader everywhere I go, and I could take my whole day telling you the things I love about this town. Uh, we have a beautiful town, and there's so many reasons for tourists to come here. Uh, one thing that I would hope to bring to council if elected is uh, virtual tourism, something I've been working on with a few people in the community and a few businesses that are very interested. If we can start selling tickets to our events on the global market, uh, there's unlimited income streams for our events. Uh, happy to talk more about that in the uh, open debate, if given the opportunity. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Cody. And that's that's it for the for everyone's got the chance to say that answer the question. So now we'll go to the open discussion. Oh, uh, yeah, we're going to start with with I have it for Bill because Bill has a chance, and then we'll go to Uta. Thank you very much. I just like to chime in here on the tourism and one of the initiatives that came to council this term that I rejected, and I want to pledge so that my continued rejection of it, and that's something called the municipal accommodation tax or the mat tax. It's the wrong time, in my mind, to penalize tourists visiting our hotels and motels as we struggle to, struggle to recover from the pandemic. We should be looking at multi-day events instead that encourage people to come and stay in our lodgings and help support the hotels that stepped up to house and support our homeless population throughout the pandemic and are now struggling to remain viable but now that the funding's cut off. They don't need a disincentive applied to them even if the beneficiaries of the funds are largely the town and marketing efforts. There's got to be a better way. Uh, the examples presented to council, for those of you who uh, weren't aware of this, were all cities and not towns. So uh, this is something, a conversation we need to have early in the term, and I suspect a uh, staff report will be forthcoming uh, around budget time about implementing the municipal accommodation tax. And I just want to formally put my stance out there that it's not a bad plan, it's just a bad time. Thank you, Bill. And Uta? In the back to marketing and promotion, we really, really need to tap into our digital Main Street uh, assets here in town and maybe have some workshops on learning how to hashtag our posts on social media better. Um, I used to just post my videos on Facebook, but I, in April, I started posting my vignettes on TikTok. I thought, well, I like doing shorts. So since April, I've got almost 400 videos up on, on TikTok, and well, they average between 60 and 100 views. I, I have to say two of our butter tart videos uh, achieved one 3,500 views and uh, one of them about 1,900 views. So if you, if you can learn how to hashtag and you can use the social media and get more people, you know, who are interested in, in digital marketing, which is a way of life, we are, we are as digital as we are organic at this point have workshops so those of us who are into this kind of promotion can start to get together and start supporting each other in in this kind of marketing because we care about midland as everybody at this table cares about midland and we want to make sure that it's uh that we bring in young people as well as mature people to to explore our region as well and we have to go where the young people are which is in the hashtags in the digital world <laughs> thanks Thanks, uh, Jonathan, and then uh, Stuart. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, we're so very fortunate to have an incredible network of uh, tourism assets in, that we can continue to partner with. Uh, Heroni Historical Parks, HHP, is, as it's known, uh, Wright St. Marine, Discovery Harbor, uh, Kiwan, we hope it stays, uh, Heroni Museum in town. And the Shrine offers huge partnerships for as they're bringing um, people up from the city uh, to celebrate various feast days, to, you know, to partner with Midland Cultural Center, uh, obviously, there's the Y March, uh, the Georgia Bay uh, National Park, and Awenda, and I think there's a huge opportunity to create some sort of a passport 
or a multi-pass system so people can visit all the different uh, assets, uh, tourism uh, facilities with just a simple pass uh, or a passport. Uh, and I also wanted to mention that uh, the Buttershard Festival, the Facebook page, it used to get a million page views. So our digital brand would spread far and wide. And we were having people from uh, upstate New York come to visit Midland for the Buttershard Festival and from people all across the province. So uh, continue to enhance the brand uh, through events and marketing and uh, digital footprint, as you mentioned earlier. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. We'll go to Stuart and then uh, Jack after Stuart. Thank you, Peter. I did find the mute button. Um, so I just want to acknowledge uh, the role of the province in a lot of these things that are happening in the town of Midland. Uh, tourism, culture and sports has underwritten a lot of these things, whether it's the uh, contributed to them, whether it's the Great Lakes Cruising Plan, business plan, whether it's the Butter Tart Festival, whether it's uh, just uh, any of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the the big duck that was at the waterfront, they support uh, they support the uh, tall ships. Uh, through RTO7, through Tourism Simcoe, we also get supports. And uh, uh, as far as the MAT tax goes, the report that came to council was actually asking permission to do a consultation. It wasn't, it wasn't a recommendation to actually implement. It was to sit down with hoteliers, restaurateurs, and people who run attractions and ask, what would you want out of this and how would you like to run it if it were to actually happen? So to my knowledge, no decisions have been made to run it. I agree with uh, Councillor Gordon. It is a good idea. The time may be right now or it may not, but let's set the groundwork for it. It's not just cities. You have Bracebridge, you have Huntsville, you have Gravenhurst. They've all implemented them. And in fact, in Huntsville, they've extended it to uh, Airbnbs and other uh, other forms of rental. It's an interesting instrument. It needs to be looked at. It's uh, So I, I, I don't necessarily support the implementation. The analysis needs to be done, and that's what staff is looking to do. There's no plan to implement a MAT tax, regardless of what anybody says at the moment. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Uh, and Jack? Yeah, thank you. In my career, I was involved with uh, tourism for a lengthy period. I've sat on tourism boards, uh, Ontario Lake Country, Midland Penitentiary, Wachine Tourism Consortium, uh, Muskoka Tourism, Aboriginal Tourism for Ontario. I've traveled to California, New York, just to be part of the tourism and learning what, what tourism is all about, and part of my career. I find the UNESCO Geopark will create new opportunities uh, not just with uh, conservation tourism, but we're also looking for, uh, they call them geosites. Uh, the definition for geosites has to do with geology and the occupation of through history of people and their activity uh, with different settings around Georgian Bay. Midland has a great opportunity here because we're in two physical regions of the Canadian Shield and the... Uh, uh, southern lowlands of Georgian Bay. And I think uh, if products can be developed, uh, they can be part of the greater tour of Georgian Bay uh, with the circle tour. And we're, we'll be cons uh, consulting with a lot of municipal co communities as well as First Nations to come up with new products. And I think Midland can be part of that, uh, that adventure as we uh, progress with the geo park. So there are opportunities in new tourism. And I think that's the aspect of not having the traditional tourism of just accommodations and attractions. This is relatively something new that we can tap into. I think Midland has that opportunity. And I think it'd be interesting to see what can be uh, uh, brought up with that opportunity. So that's just something I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jack. And I saw Cody, did you uh, want to say hi? Yeah, thank you very much. I think, uh, I, I firstly just want to say I support the UNESCO Geopark uh, that, that Jack um, works for. Uh, I, I want to commend uh, Uda Schmidt-Jones on her comments about social media utilization and hashtagging. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity. It's free marketing and it, it's worldwide. Um, I think we have an open communications manager position. I think the ongoing theme of this debate so far has been lack of communication for residents, lack of communication to tourism, uh, lack of communication uh, to boards and committees. So I think uh, we need to utilize the communication manager position to fill that hole. 
And I just wanted to commend uh, you for that idea. I think it, it wraps in nicely with my virtual reality tourism that comes at very low cost and uh, can be spread across the world, very low cost and can be a great income stream for the municipality. So uh, I love the tourism conversation. I love the events conversation. I drive every board nuts with uh, my event ideas. So I, I love this conversation. I just thank you very much for being a part of it. Thank you. Oh, great, thanks, Cody. And we'll give uh, Stuart the last word. Thank you, Peter. I just wanted to add to Jack's comment about geoparks. There are uh, over about 170 geoparks in 44 countries and they mutually market each other. Everything from local foods to indigenous, local indigenous cultures to the physical attributes of the of the area, you know, the beautiful landscapes of Georgian Bay. Georgian Bay uh, Geopark has the potential to be the largest geopark in, in Canada. Um, it's, I'd also like to just add that the uh, we have another another feature here. It's actually painted on the on the elevator, and that was first contact between French and English, and sorry, French and Indigenous cultures. This is something that is really huge in Germanic speaking company uh, countries, rather in Europe. And right now, if you wander around and go to some of the air, sorry, the, some of the bed and breakfasts in town, you'll find that most of the people the, the conversation at the breakfast table is Germans, German speaking people. They're speaking German. Why are they here? They're here to see the color, but they're also here to understand truly uh, indigenous cultures and the uh, and their history here in the area. And this, I think, I think is something that we underplay hugely. We need to sit down with uh, the the the, the uh, mostly First Nation, Rama First Nation, um, and, and and really get to the heart of how we can. Get the message out. We're talking about truth and reconciliation and so on. So let's get that message out to the broader world and not just. And the one thing I've learned in listening to this is there's not a truth. There's our collective truths and getting to a common message and getting that out. Huge opportunity there. And I think we need to take advantage of it. Geoparks will help with that. Thank you, sir. Okay. And we'll move on to the uh, final question. What is your view? On the Midland Landing project, are the people of Midland being properly represented by the board? And is 25% public land to 75% private a fair deal as outlined on the town website? Uh, yeah, it was brought to my attention that that 25% that might include the roads. I don't know, maybe something can clarify that. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, uh, to start the question, we'll go with uh, Jonathan. Uh, you can start. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I've been a supporter of Midland Bay Landing since election in 2014. I was fortunate to be on the committee uh, for several years. Um, and I, the current uh, Midland Bay Landing Development Corporation is a skills-based bo skills board, and we have some great representation. We have one representative who has experience with the Big Master Innovation Park, which is a similar situation. It's not waterfront, but it's a brownfield where they've had multiple levels of government invest and revitalize the site. For me, it, it, it kind of bounces all of the different needs of, of Midland, right? It achieves uh, economic investment, but also environmental sustainability and social benefits. Uh, public realm and parks is a huge emphasis. 100% of the waterfront uh, to be public access and public ownership is very important. Um, it has a mix of housing use, usages. I think that's very important. Missing middle housing is, is really important. So making sure the units are of various size, various price points of affordability. Um, it also touches on in intensification, as we talked about. This is an important uh, land use policy. Uh, there's great opportunities for green technologies, green roofs, or even green buildings. Um, and uh, one of the hugest concerns is the brownfield remediation. So this addresses that. And so the housing pays for the public realm improvements. It pays for the remediation. And plain and simple, it's not viable in its current state. There has to be redevelopment of some form. And so, but people are correct that the, the current development needs as much biomass and plants and nature and trees as possible and very supportive of that. And so if we move to the next phase with our development uh, developer, then we uh, move towards urban planning and design guidelines where we can have a real fulsome uh, public consultation on what people want the buildings to look like and what people would like the public and parks to look like as well. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, Uta. What is your view on the Midland Bay landing project? Are the people of Midland being properly represented by the board? And is 25% public land to the 75% private affair deal as outlined on the town website? 
So Midland should pause the project, seeking Indigenous community leadership and residential public engagement before proceeding. We should look to the Chigamic and Waypoint Medical Building nearby to lead the aesthetic of the development and planning for this remarkable section of natural Georgian Bay shoreline. Less concrete, more natural walking surfaces like boardwalks and organic trails. Thank you. Thanks, Uta. Next, we'll go to Stuart. What is your view on the Midland Bay Landing Project? Are the people in, of Midland being properly re represented by the board? And is 25% public land to the 75% private a fair deal as outlined on the town website? I fully support the continuation of the Midland Bay Landing development uh, as, as outlined in the master plan and embedded in our official plan. Uh, but I would have to say that in terms of representation, the board has annually presented its work plan and its budget to every council and every council has approved it. So in terms of representation, if we're the representatives of the public, we have approved it. I'd also like just to go on and say that it, 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 it touches all, uh, all of the salient points of what you would want in a development uh, on the waterfront. Uh, as Councillor Main has suggested, it is in fact uh, the potential for a green space, uh, so a lead development, uh, pu pu putting in uh, fifth generation uh, communications technology, fiber optics. Um, the developers are very interested in ensuring that they build something that is going to be used and therefore they're very consultative with the public in the local environment. They've shown that over and over again. Uh, you do have access to the water right from the water's edge. You can dip your toe in there if your legs long enough, right back 100 feet. There's nothing between you and the waterfront for 100 feet other than amenities like benches, a shades, perhaps a vendor selling, uh, I don't know, uh, something a soft drink or, or an ice cream or something like that. You can fish there, you can be there with your family, enjoy the sunrise, the sunset, whichever time of day happens to be uh, your favorite. I think it's important to say that uh, the, de de the developer is funding all the public realm at no cost to the town of Midland. You're looking at anywhere from 60 to $100 million worth of development of public realm when you consider potential for a splash pad, which you can turn into a rink, uh, healing gardens, uh, 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 not an arena, but a, 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 a space for entertainment and so on. It's a nice blend. And as Councilman Main again said, it's, uh, it, it touches all the uh, new concepts around intensification and, and, uh, and housing. Great opportunity. I, I, some suggest pause. I say seize the moment. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Uh, next, we'll go to, uh, to Jack Conton. What is your view on the Midland Bay Landing Project? Are the people of Midland being properly represented by the board? And is 25% public land to the 75% private? A fair deal is outlined on the town website. Oh, just a mute check. Twice. You may have to hold the space bar, Jack. Okay, I have to hold it, the space bar. Okay, thank you. I believe before signing the offer, we need to take one last look at what the people of Midland want. The people are far more engaged now than they were 10 years ago, when the whole thing was just a dream. They want to be informed and have an opportunity to have input. They don't feel that there's been the degree of transparency they deserve, and they don't think most of council has listened to their concerns this term. I'll listen. I'll be in favor of switching out some of members of the corporation's board who have contributed what was needed at the time for more local representation. I'd like to see more transparency and ensure that They've lived up to all the obligations in the original agreement. I'd like to consider having an increase in public space or at least better use of the public space. The Midland Bay Landing should be a special place for people to experience and enjoy nature and water. Thank you, Jack. Next, we go to Cody. What is your view on the Midland Bay Landing project? Are the people of Midland Bay being properly represented by the board and is 25% public land to the 75% private, a fair deal as outlined on the town website. 
Thank you very much. I support wholeheartedly moving forward with phase one of the Midland Bay Landing Project. The phase one approval is about a third of the property. Uh, as mentioned in the question, a quarter of that will be public parkland. It pays off the entirety of our debt on the property, which is about four and a half million dollars, and adds public elements that we would not be able to fund on our own without further tax increases or going deeper into reserves. I feel the deal that we have made is a good one. I think it's a step in the right direction to getting shovels in the ground on this project. Uh, it's, it's extremely important to me that the public elements that were proposed in phase one are followed through on, more fishing, 100% public access and ownership of the waterfront, and I will not support proceeding with anything less than what we've been promised. There will still be public input moving forward through the process. I've been watching this project unfold for the last eight years. I feel the board is amazing. Uh, I think they've done a great job. I, I will admit that we've had some uh, communication issues with the public has been a theme through this debate. Uh, I think that the board has been, um, they've put in way more hours than they've been compensated for. I feel the product that they've delivered and the developer they've brought to us is a great win for us. I think that rethinking means undoing a lot of the progress that we've made to this point, and I'm not running to go backwards. Uh, this has become a heated topic, and I feel that misinformation has had a big part to play in that. I think the claim by Mr. Content of luxury condos for rich people of the city is inappropriate. I think it creates an unnecessary divide in our community, and us versus them with anyone not born in Midland. Uh, I don't think small politics should be ugly. I want the community to be able to trust and respect their council, town staff, boards, and committees. I commit to being open, transparent, and honest with everyone. I also commit to being respectful of our staff, employees, and boards as well. Our town deserves it. Thank you. Thanks, Cody. And now we'll go to uh, Bill Gordon. What is your view of the Midland Bay Landing Project? Are the people of Midland being properly represented by the board? And is 25% public land to the 75% private affair deal as outlined on the town website? All right, well, in case no one watches the news for the past year, I'm the candidate running for mayor that supports the pause. So I am supportive of responsible development of Middle Bay Landing. However, it's been 10 years since it's first received public input, and bringing it out for review would allow us to ensure that it meets the needs of our present-day community. Some feel that those consultations done a decade ago satisfy that requirement, and there's no appetite to change course or revisit the plan, despite the pandemic and the renewed application and appreciation for public outdoor spaces. The percentages may change, but our master plan remains intact. This is not about going to the shredding box. Much of the 25% public land may end up being that steep hill and embankment that's not suitable for housing. We don't know. There's so many things we don't know about this, and yet we're being encouraged to sell first and ask questions later. The statements about the housing lowering your taxes is just simply false. How many hundreds of new luxury townhomes have been built in Midland over the past 10 years, and how much have your taxes gone down? I know the answer to that question, and so do you. Again, there are literally thousands of homes and apartments stuck in planning phases that are going to help ease our tax burden once they get some traction again. And phase two, forget about phase two, that's decades away. We need more walking trails, maybe a splash pad, amphitheater, event spaces, an event center. All of these could form part of phase one. With so many residents in Midland, new residents, now is the time to revisit this plan before agreeing to sell the land and forever wonder what could have been. I urge you to vote for candidates who support a pause and rethink. We have the capacity to pay off our debt, and we have nothing but time to reconsider how to make it more reflective of what we want our community to be for decades to come. We can tame our taxes through responsible development and growth by taking a hard line on controlling our spending and start putting our community first. Hey, thank you, Bill. Uh, now we're going to open it to open discussion, and I have uh, Jonathan here to go first to start it off. And we'll go to Uta. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, and that's one thing that uh, Mayor Strathern mentioned, which is a really important part, is that uh, since uh, we've enacted it, ever since I've been on council since 2014, we've had nothing but ongoing dialogue and, and consultation, integration of the Midland Bay Landing uh, Plan into our official plan, which had extensive consultation. Um, one thing, though, is with the hardened seawall, uh, it's going to mean that uh, the interface with the water is going to be different. So hopefully we'll be able to have some finger docks so people can interact with the water can, for boating. Uh, I think a lot of people are very excited about amphitheater. Uh, a lot of people mentioned that they were very fond of that. Uh, there is also still an opportunity to drop in a little bit of sand and make a little pocket beach, as you've seen elsewhere. Uh, probably the sand won't make it to the water, but if you put up some umbrellas, it, it, it achieves some of those beautiful public realm uh, but uh, just wanted to mention that, that it's, it has gone through extensive consultation and this achieves all of our goals and achieves a brownfield remediation and it's housing and has environmental and public realm benefits as well. Thank you. 
You think Jocelyn and uh, Uta? I'm not saying it, an amphitheater isn't a great idea, but remember there are some pretty big waves coming off that uh, off that uh, section of Georgian Bay, and it's a, it's not the quietest place. It's it's naturally a wonderfully loud spot, and we have a beautiful amphitheater in the lake park that is completely underutilized. It could be developed to a much better capacity. Uh, and we could be using that space. I'm also concerned about an event space that, again, belongs to the town of Midland. Uh, I, not that not every event series has to belong to the town of Midland. We haven't had venues for even to have um, council debates for this election because the only places we can go is, is it's owned by the town of Midland. We need places where we can meet um, for these kinds of events that are not just owned by the town of Midland. The concern about housing at the Midland Bay Landing point, uh, section, there are, there are a lot of concerns about Airbnbs right now and, and short-term rentals. And we know that global interest in high-end properties is increasing. Um, they don't come and live here, they rent the places out and they turn them into Airbnbs. That is a concern that you're going to put in some beautiful homes and they're going to be very, very social places. Um, something to think about anyway. All right, thanks. Thanks, Uta. Okay, uh, Stuart, and then I saw Jack there. Oh, and sorry, Bill was, yeah, we'll get to you there. So Stuart now. Thank you. I think it's important to recognize that consultation doesn't stop at the end of the exclusivity period. In fact, it begins because you're into a mandated by law consultation process around zoning. The last time we did a consultation, we agreed, was about 10, like a formal develop a plan was 10 years ago. Council of Maine suggested that that plan would probably withstand uh, scrutiny today, and that's where we'd end up again. I believe he is correct. Nonetheless, we do have we do have a venue for people to show up, and if people show up the same way they showed up to the first one, it will be a great process. That's a big if, because as Councilor Maine said, we went through an official plan amendment dealing with this very thing. Nobody showed up. So I would encourage people who have a strong interest in this to actually show up to these processes. The developer really wants to hear from you, truly wants to hear from you. As far as the amphitheater space, we I already know that there are people ready to partner from the private sector to make it a real happening spot, as well as MCC to make it a really happening spot. As far as housing goes, this isn't necessarily the, uh, the be all and end all to housing. We have a housing committee that's putting forward a community uh, community improvement plan. It'll go to the minister and it will take a hard look at incentivizing people uh, uh, for to build housing in the community, including industry who have already suggested they're interested and some of the institutions. The other thing about Midland Bay Landing, my niece and my nephews and my son all work in the tech sector. They'd all love to come back here. And this particular thing, offers them that opportunity to do so. They work with pretty people like Intel. So you start to bring high quality jobs into the community and people who can really contribute. So I would suggest first, show up to these things, seize the moment, let's move forward. There's no sense in pausing. You're going to have input. So let's leave it at that, thank you. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Uh, we'll go to Jack and then Bill. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to say that <clears throat> I've been involved with the Ministry of Aboriginal Tourism, and, um, but not, sorry, Aboriginal Tourism, and Aboriginal Affairs and Land Claims Negotiations uh, for the last uh, little while. Um, but one of the principles of uh, <clears throat> consultations, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, First Nations or whether it's uh, uh, the general public, uh, uh, the process recall calls for not just sharing information about where we are, what we're going to be doing. We're in the in-depth consultations now of the final product. And I haven't heard anything in the last number of years. It just appeared in the paper recently of what is acquired, what, what's going to be presented in, in, in this development. So consultation is really important to the community. And that's what I've been hearing on the campaign trail, knocking on doors. They want to know, they want to become involved again. 
But I'm saying we need to have a level of consultation that's more in depth of what the developer is going to produce and offer and how we're going to have an impact on the community. But the community needs to have a say. That's all I'm saying. It's all based on fact. And I, and I think we need to look at the definition of rethink. Rethink means a lot of different things for different people. If you interpret it differently, then that, that's not the case. It involves true consultations, transparency of where we are. That's how land claims work with First Nations. And that's how claims work today with the general public on tourism products de development. All I'm saying is, let's look at it. Let's have a, an opportunity to for the people to have a say. It may remain the same. We don't know that. But we got to provide that opportunity. So for me, rethink means a lot of different things. And it's interpreted all based on facts. It's a principle approach. It's not a positional approach. It's a principle approach to negotiations, to consultation. And that's what the public wants. And all I'm saying, I support that. And I put that in my campaign. And I will never back down from that because it's the people's community that we're dealing with here. So I want to stress that. It's communication. It's a two-way street, and I believe in that. And the final thing I have to say is that the shareholder direction in the operating agreement was signed with the town with the Midland Bay Landing Development Corporation. In that agreement, there's a, supposed to be a business plan that guides the development. And I haven't seen that yet. I don't, I, whether it's, there's a document there, maybe the mayor, uh, the assistant deputy mayor, or people that are on the particular board may produce that. But I, how do you measure progression in the, in the people who have been hired on the development corporation to fulfill that? Was there ever an evaluation of the performance that was done from the business plan that guides the direction. That's what I'd like to know. And that's part of the consultation process. Are we on the right track? Probably we are. But if we're not, let's correct that. And that's all I'm saying was to rethink. And to Cody's question about uh, being prejudiced about uh, the rich people, it's a fact. It's just a fact. And I'm not being biased with anybody. Anybody can come and enjoy the lake shore, the lake, the bay. And that's all I'm saying is let's rethink it from that perspective. Miigwech. Thank you, Jack. We'll go to Bill and then I saw Stuart. Thank you. I just want to speak to the, uh, the fact that the words affordable, attainable, or missing middle are ever used in the context of Midland Bay Landings residential development. There's no missing middle or affordability or attainable housing going to be built there. Just look to the east, to the homes that are listed, the new ones, where the chair of the board lives. The new version of those homes are listing and starting at $1.6 million each townhome. So trying to sell Midlanders that housing on the waterfront is going to be anything but luxury or ultimately short-term rentals held by offshore interests is absolutely disingenuous. So it would be really good of us just to park that one. Secondly, a pause. I'm only talking about a few months here, and it would include our developer, and they could participate in the pause, and I'd expect them to, so that we know that we're getting this right, and so would they. I'm prepared to accept the output, may almost mirror the input, and once we have a clear mandate from the public, which this mayoral race is largely about, I'll see this through tirelessly for the rest of the term. As mayor, I won't stand against anything that the majority of our community wants, and this election will send a clear message. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Stuart? And just in response to Jack's question about whether there was adherence to a plan and whether there was a plan, Midland Bay Development Corporation Board presented work plans every year to council, along with a budget. And every year they came back with performance report, typically, if not quarterly, at least semi-annually. 
they have adhered to the terms of reference. And as far as pause to have a conversation, I don't know why you would pause to have a conversation when there's a two-year pause while we go through zoning, up to two years. If you need more than two years to figure out what you're doing and having input into this process, why I, I, I have to wonder, as far as uh, uh, Councillor Gordon's comments about uh, missing middle and low income housing on the waterfront, I don't agree with that at all. I agree with his comments, actually. There are, it will not happen. It's not, it's, it's, it's just doesn't, it's not a reality. And if somebody's going to come in here and spend six, between 60 and $100 million to do public realm improvements, they're going to have to have a return. And it's not in attainable housing. Attainable housing will happen throughout the community. That's a commitment from me to the community. I've said that before when I've been knocking on doors. It's been something that's been a very uh, a personal thing for me uh, ever since I started as mayor. I, I commit to making sure that it happens. I know this council is committed to making sure that happens. I wish we'd had a little better performance in the homeless committee in terms of helping with them. That didn't happen. Um, and so... You do have a chance here in the next two years or, or one year, whatever, it'll be two year pro up to two years to do this, uh, to have significant input. You've had a chance to have significant input in meetings. So just consider that. And, and when these meetings occur, show up. You've had an opportunity. Everybody's had an opportunity to do that. Nobody has shown up. So thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, we'll go to Uta and then I see Jack's hand. So I, I think I was present at the, the consultations 10 years ago. Uh, I believe Gordon McKay was the, the uh, mayor at the time. I am not aware, and I apologize because I have just returned to Midland in 2020. I was away for five years. And um, if there were public consultation meetings in the five years that I was away from Midland, and respectfully, Mayor Strathern, um, if you had five years that I wasn't here. I, I'm not aware of any public consultation meetings that happened in the town of Midland on anything, but not a, certainly not about Midland Bay Landing Project. Um, that is what I've been told by people in the community who want a voice. And people in this community want to be have public consultations on all kinds of matters in the town of Midland. And I'm not aware in the last four years, and, it, and I apologize if I'm wrong, but I'm not aware of any kind of, and yes, we were in COVID for two years, but we also had Zoom. We could, we could have had you know, that wonderful tool. Have there been any kind of public consultation meetings in the last four years? Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll go to Jack and then I see Stuart after that. Thank you. I'll just be brief. I think we have to distinguish the difference between a work plan versus a business plan. Uh, I'm not satisfied with the answer of the work plan because the business plan is something that guides the principles of the group that's doing the work. And then you look at the objectives of whether it was accomplished. What I'm hearing is that a work plan is just as good as a business plan. And I mean, I disagree with that because most business plans are for a long term. It's not year to year in adjusting it. You've got it. If unless you put the three or four uh, or four uh, work plans together to become a business plan, then I would agree with that. But it's not a year to year basis. And that's a concern I have. It's just, you know, we don't have that plan to look at to say, yes, we were, we made the right choices. And I think, you know, uh, that needs to be looked at. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Stuart, I saw, I think you're up. Thank you, Peter. Um, to Uda's question, we've had uh, quite a few actually public information sessions around various master planning exercises, soliciting public input, whether it's the water master planning exercise, whether it was a wastewater master planning exercise, whether it was the official plan exercise, whether it was the parks and trails uh, uh, master plan exercise, whether it was transportation, multimodal transportation, I could go on. So there've been lots of them. It's, 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 some people have showed up, particularly if they have an interest, a lot of people haven't. 
Uh, it's unfortunate that you weren't aware of them. They were well advertised if you were on the town website and engaged in the town of Midland. I would also suggest to Jack that there was, in fact, a business plan. It was called the Uniman Waterfront Master Plan. And that in its turn, with that in its turn was embedded into the official plan for which we had public consultations. I didn't see you there. Uh, and uh, nor did I see you there at any of these other planning exercises that went on. So yes, there's been planning. Yes, there's a business plan through which the wind had work plans that tell us how we're going to accomplish that in, in, in bite-sized pieces in ways that may logically make sense. Presented to council by experts in the field. These people do this not for money, I believe me, because they, they get paid diddly doodly. They do it for love of community. They're from around here, either by cottaging or living here, and they are very passionate about getting it right. And they're very passionate about, as we get into this two-year phase, that people come forward and participate, including this group. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Anyone else have anything to add to, to this uh, discussion? We're good? Okay, thank you. Okay, that does it for the questions. Uh, now it's time for the concluding statements from our candidates. Uh, you should get one minute for this and we'll start with, uh, with Uta. This has been an incredibly civil debate and I have enjoyed this participation. I'm so, I'm so hopeful that we have such incredibly intelligent people who come to the table. And I felt the same way about uh, our municipal uh, council candidate debate as well, which I watched on Zoom. I also feel a little bit like we are Midland's Brady Bunch with the Zoom um, layout here. And we're just looking up, looking down. It's kind of fun. And, and maybe some of you are too young to know what the Brady Bunch is, and I apologize for that. The role of Midlands Mayor, I offer communications as my credentialed special specialty. I have a degree in broadcasting from, for, uh, and I and I uh, tourism is definitely my thing. I, I worked for the Ontario Lottery Corporation on a television show called Winterio, where I was a script writer and uh, video segment producer for a couple of years. Um, oh. Is it almost over? Sorry. Yeah, you get a minute. So okay. So yeah, wrap it up there. Well, I'm just going to say, please reach out to my email address. I'm utasj at simpatico.ca. And let's get digital. Thanks. Thanks, Uta. Sorry to rush you on that one. But yeah, it's one minute. And uh, now we're going to go to uh, Stuart Strathern for a closing statement. just want to thank again the uh, chamber for putting this on. I agree with Uta. It's been pretty collegial, um, unlike some debates I've seen in other places. Uh, I'd just like to uh, also thank the current council. When we first were elected back four years ago, I went, holy mackerel, what, what have I got myself into? And I have to say, it's been a pleasure working with you, a very diverse group of people, willing to think, willing to work on the data, with the data, not emotion, and willing to uh, uh, have a, a, a fulsome debate, have a vote, and then move on to the next issue. So thank you for that. Uh, I feel I provide a strong, progressive, and experienced leadership throughout this piece uh, to continue building on the, uh, the foundations laid for our growing and prosperous community. And I would just ask that uh, you vote for Stuart Strathern, the mayor that's going to get this all done. Uh, no pause. And I also would uh, ask you to go to the, uh, my website, stuartstrathern.ca, and then you can see uh, the various things I'm about. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, Jack Conton for uh, closing statements. Thank you to the Chamber of Commerce. Listen, folks, it's about your elected officials listening. I have hope for our community. Your voice matters. I will lead with respect and listen to all opinions. I pledge to have open dialogue with having healthy discussions. More importantly, I will listen and bring your voice to the table. It's time for our community to heal from the pandemic. It's time to tell the world we are the heart of Georgian Bay. Remember, whether you are voting online, by telephone, or in person at the council chambers between October the 11th and the 24th, please vote Jack Conson for deputy mayor. Miigwech. Thank you, Jack. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, Cody Wachewski for your final statements. 
Thank you very much. Everybody should have got a, every Midland resident should have got a piece of mail from me today and you can scan the QR code in the corner to get to my website. It's Codio for Midland.ca. Uh, I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce for putting this on. I want to thank my fellow candidates here and the council candidates at the all candidates meeting. No matter what happens here, it's a very noble and respectful thing to do to put your name in to uh, represent your community. I would lastly like to thank the residents taking the time to be here watching this. It means you're likely to vote and I think that's a great thing for your community as well. I would be extremely proud and grateful to serve you for four more years as your deputy mayor. I won't let you down. I will represent you on all local issues here and at the county level. I'll help new councillors get on their feet and I'll commit to learning as much as I can from other councillors I sit with as well. I'm a lifetime learner. I will be respectful, honest and transparent in all of my actions and I will commit to doing my part to building Team Midland within council, within the organization, within the community. I do this for my wife, Jody. I do this for my daughter, Nova. I do this for my mom, Candace, and my dad, Chris, and I do this for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cody. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, Bill Gordon for a final statements. Thanks for hosting this. This election is about a change in leadership, a referendum on your council and Midland Bay Landing, quite frankly. This is not about reversal, a simple course correction to the good ship Midland. We need to set our sights on the same North Star, establish a common vision for what we want for Midland to be for generations to come. Now we want to shape our waterfront for both residents and visitors alike while preserving that small town charm. We have to manage our expenses, our revenues, the service delivery as we build a post-pandemic vision and strategy for Midland's growth and prosperity. We have to keep Midland affordable for our residents while attracting new residents to help share the cost while enjoying our resources. I can promise you a more accessible, responsible and collaborative council at Town Hall and that we're going to revisit how our services are provided, how much they cost and how to stop focusing on how to raise taxes and instead to look first at how to control our spending. As we all struggle to come out of the pandemic, deal with inflation, climate change, homelessness, affordability, lack of housing and community safety. Again, I'm Bill Gordon. I represent responsible change and I've proven that I am the leader who listens and I can work with anybody. Merci. Thank you. Chimekwich. Thank you, Bill. Uh, next, we go to Jonathan for a final statement. I uh, just want to thank uh, the Chamber and I want to thank everybody uh, out there watching and uh, thank you to all the candidates that are running uh, for the selection. It's very important that people are engaged and they vote. I wanted to offer my skill set, um, skilled, experienced, knowledgeable and approachable. I always have taken a multidisciplinary approach to public policy and I want to be uh, known as a kind, fun and youthful mayor. Uh, and Midland can prosper with collaboration. Midland is a very livable community and we have a very high quality of life and that comes from quality of services. Uh, I also wanna thank my amazing wife, uh, not just for helping out in the last uh, few weeks and months over the campaign, but over the last four years, especially watching the kids during all of our Zoom meetings from home. And I wanna thank all the volunteers and supporters. Uh, thank you for all the well wishes, uh, good lucks. And, uh, and I can't wait to see the, the remaining portion of town. We have a little bit left to go and I have a few more doors to hit. Uh, the goal is to hit every single house in town. And if you want to reach out for more information, Midland, Maine, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, Gmail, and October 11th to 24th, please vote for Jonathan Maine for mayor. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, and thank you uh, very much uh, to all of you. Uh, I have to agree with you. It's a, it, uh, it was a good evening. I think uh, it went quite well. It was a... Uh, I've learned a lot, and uh, I think uh, maybe we should do this on a monthly basis with the new the new council. People send in questions and uh, get people more informed, and more uh, and more into it, and more active in the politics of the town. Um, I'd like to thank the candidates uh, for attending tonight, and for those tuning in this evening. It provides your it proves your uh, political involvement that is important to our community. I'd also like to ask for those watching tonight, and I say this after all these candidate meetings, uh, that uh, that you talk to the people that aren't here tonight. And, uh, and ask them to vote, tell them to vote, get them out, get them out and, and uh, voice an opinion. It's, it's just the way we're going to build this community and move forward. Um, I, I think uh, it, that's on, on Monday, October 24th, add that too. I'd, I'd like to especially thank Kathy uh, for tonight and for all the nights that she's done for all the, uh, the uh, all candidates meetings. It's, uh, it's good. I appreciate her staying late. Um, and uh, of course, I'd like to thank um, the candidates for being here the volunteers that put in hours helping on your campaigns. Now, these are people behind the scenes that we don't see, but that's, again, as, as Jonathan's alluding to, there's just a lot of work that goes on that we don't know about, especially your time as well. It's, I mean, let's face it, uh, you guys all got uh, families and, and uh, issues and businesses to deal with. So uh, to see you all here is fantastic. I appreciate it. And uh, willing to put time into the community. Um, 
I think that's about it. I, I, again, I'd like to thank you all for being here um, and have a good night and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us or connect with us on social media. something to share let everyone know about your next meeting your need for volunteers or your fundraising event